Normally, I like to open these episodes with quite a cerebral sort of question, but instead, here's something a little bit different. What would you do if you went to Mars and everyone there was a cat? It might sound silly, but that's what happens in the pretty serious novel that me and my guest are going to be looking at in today's episode. That's Cat Country Mao Chongji by Lao Shi. Before we talk about that, though, here's one little fun piece of、uh, promo for the podcast I'll direct you guys towards. Um, so, I made some tags to kind of divide the episodes up into categories to make it easier for you guys to kind of browse the backlist of episodes. They're on the podcast homepage at t r u c h f i c t r c h f i c p o d b e a n c o m And we have like an all sci fi episodes list,、uh, we have an all wuxia episodes list, there's an existential list,、um, and other ones that I'm hoping to grow as the podcast goes on, like one for Taiwanese writers, one for Hong Kong writers. And maybe most fun of all, there's one called the Trichific Criterion Collection, which is,、uh, in my opinion, all the best episodes. So if you want to hear the best ones in quote marks, they're all under that tag. So yeah, go check that out. And without further ado, let's get on to the Trichific news, the translated Chinese fiction news. So I've picked stuff、uh, of a sci fi sort of、um, persuasion since we're doing an important book in the history of Chinese sci fi for our episode. So here's our first one. It's an article. It's pretty new. This one got posted、uh, on September 25th. And it was posted, funnily enough, on KoreanLiteratureNow.com. But it's not about Korean literature, it's about Chinese sci fi. It's called Chinese Science Fiction Goes Global. So a little bit of a generic、um, headline, but this is actually a really good article. So、um, I tweeted about this saying that there are a lot of intros to Chinese、uh, sci fi online. And in print, and that's, that's true. But this one is brand new and it is very up to date. And it's by someone who's written、uh, online about this before, Regina Kanyu Wang, who is herself.、Um, she's involved in the publication or、uh, popularization of this stuff at home and overseas. And she's a,、uh, a young Chinese sci fi writer herself. So, yeah, it's a really good little article because it isn't just about the content of the stories, it kind of goes into in a fair amount of detail institutions,、uh, government and, and、uh, private ones that are involved in, in this stuff,、uh, awards, translation, and also it talks about not just, not just Chinese and English、um, or Chinese to English translation, but also the translation of Chinese sci fi into other languages like、uh, Italian, German. And obviously, Korean, because it's on KoreanLiteratureNow.com. So, yeah, it's well worth a read. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. That's our first news item. Our second one.、Uh, this time, we're getting a little bit more in the kind of、uh, academic study sort of field.、Um, so, this is from the Modern Chinese Literature and Culture Center.、Uh, they have posted a, a translation with pictures of Little, Little Smarty Travels to the Future, which was a comic book adaptation of、uh, a novel of the same name by Ye Yonglia. So, this is something I've never read,、uh, but it comes up a lot because it was、uh, the novel came out in 1978, so just after the end of the Cultural Revolution. And I think it, had a, it was kind of one of the、um, first resurgences of sci fi after Mao. Um, and before the whichever government initiative it was, whose name I always forget, but the anti, before the anti spiritual、uh, pollution campaign and kind of once again banned the genre.、Um, so it's just, it's just a kid's story,、um, but you can read the whole text on the MCLC's website. And it's got、uh, the captions are still on the images in Chinese, and between each Im- or underneath each image, there's an English translation.、Uh, scrolling through now. <laughs> It's pretty, it's pretty、um, cute. Yeah, it looks really sweet and funny and dated in the best possible way. So, yeah, you, you should definitely check that out. Okay,、uh, last news item is not news per se. This is just a, it's a book I bought and read and it's fantastic. And it's been recommended on the show before. And that's Nathaniel Isaacson's Celestial Empire The Emergence of Chinese Science Fiction. So, this is about. Um, the Chinese sci fi from mostly the late Qing era, so the very end of the last、uh, Chinese dynasty, because there were various works of Chinese sci fi that came out at that time. Then there was about two decades of silence, so to speak, in the genre. And then we had Cat Country, and this book has a chapter on Cat Country. So 
the news is that the book's great and you should buy it and read it. But I'm going to kind of use this as a sneaky way to sidle into the con- the main body of our episode because I read this book well after recording my interview with the- our guest, Molly Silk. And there's a couple things in the chapter on Laosha's City of Cats that I did not know um, and have learned and I think should I should probably just mention now because um, it'll shine a little bit of li- a little bit of light on the conversation I have with uh, my guest Molly. So there is a bit in the interview where I talk about uh, how the author Lao Shaw spent five years in, in England and then a year in Singapore and he was depressed about what he found when he came back to China. Actually it was only six months in Singapore. It was kind of like a, a writing and teaching layover as uh, Nathaniel describes it and there was a thing in Singapore that depressed Lao Shaw too or rather a thing a good thing in Singapore he didn't see in China and that's and which depressed him and that was that the uh, overseas Chinese he met in Singapore were quite politically active and then when he went back to China he found the people there relatively speaking were not and he felt disappointed um so that's just a small correction to what you're going to hear later in the in the uh, interview but pretty interesting and another thing i don't know how much this came up in the interview but there's something i learned from the book and i think it's really interesting um nathaniel isaacson makes an argument that the reason there was this wave of ch- late ching sci-fi then nothing then cat country and then basically nothing again so the the reason for the gap in like the uh late teens and 20s and kind of for mostly the 30s at least according to nathaniel isaacson um chinese sci-fi was sort of subsumed by other genres so there was like science and non-fiction articles explaining science and um, that kind of took over one avenue that sci-fi might have gone into and the other one was just realist fiction there was more of a focus on um stuff that was uh, grounded in reality. So the early Chinese sci-fi had a goal of educating people about science and strengthening the nation and and whatnot. Um, So it was progress-minded, but then that kind of progress-minded literary movement turned its focus to realism. And so that's another reason why sci-fi vanished at that time. I guess this maybe applies to some of the stuff I talked about in the Death's End episode as well um, with my guest Keith. But yeah, uh, that is more than enough rambling. Let's bring our intersection to an end and let's get on with the interview. Let's hear what me and Molly had to say about Cat Country. So I'm on the show with Molly Silk. Molly, it's great to have you on. How's your day going today? Hi, Angus. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, my day's going really, really well. Thank you. Um, and I'm obviously so excited to be here. I'm a really big fan of your podcast. I, I listen to, um, you know, all of your, uh, I've listened to all of your science fiction episodes. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just really great to be here. So thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, well, it is great to have you. One reason it's great to have you is we often have um, translators or academics or people in the sort of, uh, well, We'll get onto academia, but literary academics is what I mean. We often have those sort of people on, but that's not quite what you do. Can you tell the listeners a wee bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm Molly, and um, I'm currently at the University of Manchester, and I'm completing my PhD in science, technology, and innovation policy. Um, so specifically, my research focuses on China's space policy and the diplomacy of the Chinese space program, and um, all those kind of activities related to um, yeah China's endeavors in outer space. Uh, outer space. So um, that's me. <laughs> Extremely cool. Thank you. Speaking about the episode itself and the book we've chosen for this one, we've chosen Cat Country. And the episode, just in general, and the choice of Cat Country feels kind of like a weird mirror version of the other like Chinese sci-fi episodes I've done. Because yes, like um Cat Country is definitely Chinese literature. It's you know, we could quibble, but it, we could say it's pretty much sci-fi, but it's really nothing like any or barely like any of the other um Chinese sci-fi books and stories I've covered on the show. Uh, Vagabonds by Hao Jing Fang might be like the, the closest thematic relative it has. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll get on to talking about Cat Country in particular in a wee while. But first, I want to ask you, um, what was your introduction to Chinese literature slash Chinese sci-fi? And since you're looking at China's space program and and whatnot i'd be interested to know how your reading of chinese sci reading an interest in chinese sci-fi fits like chronologically with your your studies mm. did one come significantly before the other did they feed into the other blah blah blah, blah. 
I'm really keen to know about that. Great. So um, I uh, took Chinese uh, at university uh, for my undergraduate degree. So I studied um, a Chinese degree at the University of Edinburgh. And as part of the course, we did a uh, contemporary Chinese literature module. Um, so the kind of names that we looked at were people like um, Lu Xun, Eileen Chang, uh, Wang Ani, um, and kind of bigger names like that. Um, but we really didn't do much um, Chinese science fiction at all. Um, and I hadn't really started to check it out until um, my master's degree, I, I think. So my master's degree, I did a, a translation and interpreting studies. Um, right. And so so what I mainly did um, for my master's degree, I, I uh, looked more at scientific and technical translation and political translation. So again, uh, kind of looking at uh, literary translation um, wasn't really a big thing for me. So I didn't really uh, read because um, I don't really find that I get a lot of time to read outside of uh, my studies, um, or at least I didn't when I was my undergrad and master's degree. I definitely take a lot more time now um, to re read outside of my research. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of I think I started to take more of an interest in it as I started to um, kind of develop more of an interest in the Chinese space program. Um, so of course, kind of looking during my master's degree at um, scientific and technical translation um, and also political uh, sources, it somehow led me down that route of looking at science fiction, uh, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Uh, again, I don't, I, yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so I, um, I started um, wanting to know more about the Chinese uh, space program and I thought that uh, an interesting way to um, look at this would be to look at um, not just what the government was writing but what um, maybe people just um, you know uh, non-politicians uh, were writing um, and that's when I kind of started to discover works by um, you know the more prominent Chinese science fiction authors so that's how I would say I got into um, Chinese science fiction uh, more particularly um, so that's cool. my answer to that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Um, it's funny that you mentioned you did an undergrad in Edinburgh and you're now in Manchester. And in, in, in I guess, is it University of Edinburgh and University of Manchester, UOE and UOM? Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, I did kind of the reverse, uh, but at mm. Polytechnics, I did uh, English at Manchester Met. And then I did my master's in publishing at Edinburgh Napier. So I'm the right, okay. in reverse and a little bit scruffier, mm. a little bit like cat country itself in a way. Oh um, no, not, not at all. <laughs> um, so next question, how specifically did you land in cat country, uh, so to mm. speak? Because it's a little bit of an outlier when it comes in both directions. It's, um, it's not in the first wave of Chinese science fiction around um, like the fall of the Qing. And it's not in the new wave that's kind of come in the 90s and, and onwards. It's really out on its own in, in the 1930s. So how did, how did you manage to land there? Mm, so um, I, uh, I think I must have been doing some research um, on contemporary science fiction. And I was reading through an article, I can't remember which one it was, but um, it brought up Cat Country and it gave a little bit of a description about what it was about. And I just thought, wow, that sounds absolutely incredible, a fascinating story. Um, and I thought I just have to check it out um, at some point. And um, yeah, I, I was, even though, it, um, again, as I mentioned, it's not a contemporary piece of writing. Uh, it, it's definitely, it's, I mean, it's so fascinating, just the, just the, story of it wouldn't wouldn't you say yeah yeah it's um i was just thinking well I, this sort of thought has gone through my head before it's um it kind of reminds me of japanese things i've uh, read or or consumed there's two different studio ghibli movies that are about like um cat magical cats or land of the cats and i mm. actually when i was reading this book i was it I, th I paired this book. I think this. I did this in the second of a pair. I read it alongside uh, Natsume Soseki's I Am a Cat. Because I, I guess cats are, are a very universal thing. And mm -hmm. like the, the motif of like the cute cat or the funny cat is a thing that the people of East Asia and, and the Western world and probably the whole world um, can all kind of enjoy together. But like they, they, there's not really any cute cats in cat country. They're, they're more... Um, ridiculous cats but yeah the idea of like a planet of completely ridiculous cats it's um it felt 
um like it, I, I kind of felt upon hearing about cat country this should be a pretty easy book to get into it's um it's like an adventure to another planet it's a it's about a dystopia or a messed up utopia it's about cat people this sounds like something that anyone could enjoy not just someone with a particular knowledge of or interest in china but then upon reading it i've kind of I'm, i've questioned myself and wondered like if you don't know about the china at the time the book satirizing how much would you get out of the book? It's hard hard for me to know because I can't I, can, I can't just make a copy of myself who doesn't know anything about China and have him read the book. I would mm. have to speak to someone who sets out to read the thing and potentially, for all I know, might not get it at all. I don't know. So yeah, I, my next question was going to be, do you think this novel is actually sci-fi? But I guess if you can uh, tolerate a, a second question alongside that, <laughs> I'd ask, uh-huh. what, do you think someone who's like a total newcomer... Um, to not just like Chinese lit, but like Chinese history um, and society. Do you think they'd enjoy the book just as a standalone? Or do you think you need some background knowledge to really oh, know what's going mm. on? It's a bit of a poison well, chalice of a question, but just give me <laughs> any thoughts. Well, I suppose in terms of um, with anybody who, again, didn't have that background knowledge of um, Chinese history enjoy it. Um, that's very difficult to say. I mean, I I struggled at some points um, with this book because it's very hard going, isn't it? As you say, it's not a, um, you know, you think, oh, cats, okay, it's going to be a very <laughs> lighthearted, enjoyable book. And then exactly. you get into it and it's, you know, it's, it's very um, depressing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, I think if you were reading it, um, and perhaps weren't then interested in knowing more about Chinese uh, history and, and culture, you might find it quite boring. But if maybe you were reading it um, and thought, oh, okay, this is clearly uh, referring to something, um, you know, something bigger than just the, um, you know, the, the narrative, I suppose, let's on, um, perhaps then you might find some enjoyment in it, um, mm. you know, trying to understand what specifically uh, it's relating to. I mean, that's what I would say about that. What, what do you think? Do you think somebody would enjoy it? I, I think I think like a, probably most modern readers, but definitely Western readers, I think we're very used to, in our books and our films, uh, dystopias um, or post-apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic situations. And this, I feel like this book does verge on apocalyptic as well as dystopian. And I think... Mm-hmm. I think even if you didn't know what it was satirizing, I think you'd be able to pick up on the fact it was a satire. So Mm -hmm. I think you could probably read it as a satire of like a corrupt, crumbling country losing all or civilization losing all its standards and putting the wrong people in charge. And if I could keep if I keep going with this description, it might sound um, eerily (laughs) like the present in in some ways. So Mm. yeah, probably now that I'm kind of answering my own past you know myself from five minutes ago thought this was an unanswerable question and now I think I found my own answer to it Hmm, so yeah (laughs) yeah. I I think I agree with you there definitely do you think we should summarize like what this book's about now I was going to ask you the elevate like what's the elevator pitch for the book later I wonder if we've just talked in the abstract a little bit too much about the book um yeah I think perhaps it might be good to give a an introduction um, yeah. you're right so uh an elevator pitch so I think so cat country um it is about a uh a man um who uh, is from China and he crash lands on Mars and encounters a society of cat-like people um am I doing okay so far this is good. <laughs> is that, yeah. yeah good um so as he begins to learn more about this society of cat people he um, comes to realize that it is a country drowning in corruption, uh, despotism, injustice, and even addiction. Um, and despite the story being set in a very alien Martian landscape, it presents a very, um, a very forceful caricature of life in China in the early 20th century. And um, I believe it was written with the intention of warning the Chinese people um, that their present way of living may lead to the downfall of their um, long-standing uh, and cherished civilization. What do you think? <laughs> Does that sound okay? Yeah, Would you have anything to solid. add? Would I have mm-hmm. anything to add? Not. I don't think about the content of the plot. Nothing. Nothing. I think that really is crucial. The plot is kind of um, it's fairly meandering plot, really. Um, so mm-hmm. I don't think there's any plot details I need to add. I think what you said about the book being a warning of like terrible things to come that would be worth. Um, kind of meditating on for a minute because the uh, intro to the book I did did you did you read the 
English language translation or or the Chinese? How how did you read the book? Uh, so I read the Penguin Classic yeah. um, translation, that one, um, and then I went and read the, uh, or at least kind of skimmed through the Chinese version. Right. Um, so yeah, that, that was the one I read first. Mm-hmm. Um, right, because mm-hmm. the, reason, the reason I asked was I, I read the exact same one in uh, ebook mm-hmm. form, and it has an intro by this guy called Ian Johnson, who um, talks a little, well, he's, it's a very kind of like rounded sort of thoughts on the book. And one thing he um, dwells on a bit is the elements of the book, which were prophetic so the um, country has ended up a cultural desert uh, it's a country where te- schools and teachers are devalued um, students are seen um, tearing up each one of their teachers apart at one point and mm. he was writing in the early 1930s a good 30 40 years ahead of the cultural revolution which um, actually kind of brought about the end of the author's life in the first place so there are elements of the book which are crazily prophetic but yeah i think it's probably more pertinent as a description of what was ailing china at the time rather than a, a vision of, of the future if it, if it is mm. a vision of a future yeah like you said it's a bad possible future and it's a near it's a near future um which is why like it's probably one could argue it's not very sci-fi because it's not all about technology and it's not looking very far into the future it's really taking a present and exaggerating it and trying to show the reader how stupid um Lao Shu thinks the, uh, China's present situation is that's mm, that's yeah. my take but yeah that's not really me adding any plot details that's just <laughs> but I think uh, that's very interesting so it, I suppose it refers back to your question of you know is it indeed a science fiction um mm. I I, well, I I have an opinion do you have an, <laughs> do you have an opinion on uh, that not any strong opinions so mm. why don't you tell us yours Okay, so um, so of course there has been a lot of debate around this already, hasn't there? Um, uh, you know, some people are saying it is, some people are saying it isn't. Um, I think that the general consensus at the moment, from what I understand, is that it is not a science fiction. People like to uh, class it more as a, um, again, a, a satire or a dystopian um, kind of novel or, or piece of work. Um, although in the Penguin um, classic, you know, description of the version that we both read, um, it describes it as a science fiction. Mm. Um, I know that some people, um, again, uh, think that it's a science fiction novel only very superficially in that, you know, it's sat on Mars and that's about it, really. Um, nothing else about it is uh, very science fiction as you mentioned, with the technology, it isn't, there's really no reference to anything um, like that. But I think personally, and I might change my mind by the end of um, this podcast, but I think that strong arguments can be made for both sides. But I think that it can be categorised as a science fiction novel, um, at least as a kind of proto science fiction novel. Mm. Um, And I think I've got kind of two reasons for why I think this. Um, The first one is that the story is based on a kind of foundation of interplanetary travel and exploration. So we have the main character, he goes to Mars and, you know, discovers this society of cat-like people. And I think some people would say, well, it doesn't have to be set on Mars at all, really. It's got nothing to do with Mars. It could easily be set anywhere else. Um, But I think the fact that it is set on Mars, um, it is set um, in a, on a planet or in a place where we could not get to, even though it's a kind of fictional place, cats do not live on on Mars, as we know. But Listeners, um, be aware. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Um, But I think it's just that, it's the fact that it is not set you know on earth or anywhere that we would be able to get to without um kind of technical advancements or developments this i think does make it a science fiction uh, in part that that is some of the Mm. reason why it makes it a science fiction novel i mean more superficially still but i think one of the reasons uh, the second reason why i think it is a science fiction or can be categorized as a science fiction work is that it suggests a transformation on earth or specifically in China. Um, It's set in this future reality where China has the capacity to send astronauts out into space. Um, And within the uh, novel, we have the narrator saying, oh, this is 
what cat society is like. It's a terrible place to be. Nothing like that would ever happen in China, where I'm from, you know, which is this great country. And as we know, in kind of uh, when Lao Shu was writing, uh, many Chinese uh, thinkers and writers, they were of the mindset that if China could somehow inherit um, knowledge and uh, technology from the West uh, and, and from you know elsewhere and bring it to China, then that would create a stronger China. Um, so I think for Lao Tzu writing in this time period, this idea of a China that is so advanced that it can send people into space and it has slowly become a um, you know nicer place to be, it's more developed place to be. Um, this is a kind of you know, futurism in a sense or it's it's yeah. it's got themes like that so I think in a very subtle way even though it is mainly I would I would mainly categorize it as a um you know a satire or a dystopian novel I don't think we can completely rule it out and say it's definitely not a, a science fiction uh piece of work for these kind of reasons um even yeah, I think today um, we have a very strong idea of what science fiction is like and again uh, I think I I think I read on um Oh, what's that website called? Goodreads? Um, yep. Somebody described it, uh, I think, very well as it's a very good satire, but a very bad science fiction um, novel because it doesn't have these strong elements um, that we're so used to today in science fiction. Um, but I mean, I think it's always important to remember um, the time period and the country in which it was written. You know, science fiction wasn't really a thing back when, in China at least, when Lao Shu was writing. Um, and uh, I think uh, some people even call it the first Chinese science fiction novel, um, you know, at least in the 20th century, because it contained these kind of elements. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop. But I think I've been talking for too long, but um, I, I was wondering what you maybe thought about that or yeah, um, yeah. if you agree or disagree. Anything. So there's a whole, um, well, there's a body of academic work about mm. a fair number of stories and novels in Chinese from, as I was mentioning, like late Qing, early Republic of China period, where the first Chinese sci-fi uh, um, arose. And like you were saying, a, a lot of it was informed by this like desire to import um, Western science, technology, uh, blah, blah, learning. And I was reading in my, in my um, secondary reading for this episode, one of the um, articles I was reading was comparing this book to those. And a lot of those books were kind of like fan or, or some a couple of them were like fan sequels to Chinese classics. Um there is a sequel to Outlaws of the Marsh, which while not sci-fi, has some Westerners show up, they team up with the good guys and they employ incredible technology. There's a kind of a fan sequel to Dream of the Red uh Chamber. Uh it's called mm -hmm. New New Story of the Stone which is, if any, any of you listeners are familiar with the main character, uh, Bao Yu, from that, he escapes the family household. He's been trapped in the whole no really long novel, um, the Jia family household, and he goes off on a kind of a adventure of learning. I think he ends up on another planet. I don't remember. That so, sounds fascinating. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I'll have to check that out. <laughs> mm, and there, I've not read it yet, and I, I've actually not got it yet, which is to my shame. But a former guest on the show, Nathaniel Isaacson, who was on for the episode on Han Song, he wrote a book on um, that kind of Qing, late Qing uh, sci-fi. So they're... Mm. What is it called? Celestial Empire. So I'll be able to speak more about that once I've read his book. Um, mm. But yeah, a, a thing that contrasts Cat Country a lot from those stories is um, there is no, well, there is a vision of a much more technologically and endowed, powerful China, but it's off screen or off stage. We don't, we don't see it. It's just kind of implied. And there's no, there's no kind of like intertextual inclusion of the classics and there's no definitely no like efforts to infuse uh, China's rich cultural her heritage in a way that's in some ways traditional culture or traditional mindsets are kind of a a, a target in the story and anyway b before I just go on and go on and go on two things we should probably um, point out for our listeners and these are just little small technical points cat country is literally con literally a country on this planet of Mars and it's surrounded by other countries which are less dysfunctional and the cat people, this is a thing I learned in my secondary reading. So Lao Shu wrote an essay about, I think it, the English translation of the name is something like How I Wrote Cat Country, where he's mostly apologizing for short, his, what he felt were shortcomings in the book. And one of the things he said is, I think he said, uh, it doesn't matter if it's on Mars, 
you can go to Mars or you can go to hell. It's the same difference. He wrote something mm. like that. And he also said the choice to use cats isn't particularly significant. He'd recently got a pet cat. And I think he said that's why he did it. He said in the essay, it could as well have been like um, rabbit country, Tu Chongji instead of Mao Chongji. It's not the point is he just wanted something to um, take out his anger on. And if if you're happy to charge on and talk about this guy, Lao Shu, and who he was, we can maybe get into why he was so uh, fed up with with his own country at the time. Yeah, Should absolutely. Yeah. yeah, right. Because he's not just um, the author of Cat Country. He's probably more famous for uh, uh, other works. So can you tell the listeners a little bit about Lao Shu's life story, in particular, like his, his travels um, out of China and then back into China and how that maybe informed Cat Country? Sure. Um, so uh, let's think. So let's go back to when he was born. Um, so we have Lao Shu. He was born in 1899 um, and he was from um, a very poor background, I believe, Manchurian descent. Um, mm. And from what I understand, his, his father died fighting the um, eight powered allied forces um, in 1901. So he was left without a father quite early. Um, I believe his mother worked quite hard to send him to school. Um, and from what I understand, he was very highly influenced by the May the 4th movement in 1919 um it kind of gave him a he said that it gave him a new spirit and a new uh, literary language and he was very grateful to the movement as it allowed him to become a, a writer uh, laosha was a christian and he was baptized um in his early 20s and it was under the arrangement of the london missionary society um that he was able to then go to the uk and, and teach in london um at the university of London and it was at their School of Oriental Studies um, where he was a lecturer in Chinese and he um, was also doing some writing and translating while he was there. Um, so he, while he was living in London, he lived, uh, sorry, he lived there for uh, six years. Um, he read a lot of English literature, particularly um, Charles Dickens, uh, in order to improve his English. And um, he also uh, kind of saw how, you know, uh, people from the UK, Westerners viewed Chinese people. Um, and so eventually in 1930, he returned to, to China um, to kind of find it to, I think he was a bit more sensitive to uh, what it was what it was like, you know, um, having been exposed to all these criticisms of his country, of the culture. Um, and so uh, a lot of his writing sort of focuses on trying to highlight these deficiencies in Chinese culture, not particularly, not, not because he, he wants to, um, you know, just tear things apart for the sake of you know, criticizing and tearing things apart, but more because he, you know, it was his home country. He uh, had a deep affection for China, and so he wanted to see it improve. He wanted to inspire uh, people to um, kind of get on board with improving the country and, and working hard to do that. Um, so that's just one of his times outside of China, right, in, in the UK. And from what I understand, he um, so after World War Two, he went to the United States on a cultural grant and I think traveled around there for a year. Uh, that's so you've got anything to add to maybe like those um, yeah. parts? <laughs> um, yeah, so to set mm. his travels abroad and his interaction with the kind of, uh, well, outside the uh, countries beyond China in the context of cat country. So he, he went off to London. I think I glanced over this the first time I was doing my secondary reading, but I reread it just before this call. And apparently after he was done in London, he did, did a year in uh, Singapore, I think, teaching before oh, that's right. returning to China. Yeah. Yes, um, he did. Yes. Intro. Mm. I mean, I'd love to know what he got up to there. I suppose I could find out if I was really determined, but yeah. <laughs> so he came back to China by way of Singapore and th this is the time when he wrote Cat Country. And I guess, I, I don't know the exact spe the, sp the specifics here, but I think he had a little bit of a reverse culture shock. He probably felt that he was coming back into a country that was in a, in a bad way, perhaps in decline. And I think perhaps compared with the standards of living and I don't want to say something as mean as civilization, but um, yeah, the security he maybe had seen and enjoyed mm -hmm. in London. And then he comes back to a country which is in a like a warlord uh, period, is on the receiving end of aggression from uh, Japan and is has still not really broken out of the colonial era. I think he felt pretty disappointed with um, where China was going. And I, the secondary reading I'd done suggested this might have compounded on top of being... Uh, 
having lost his father, being in the Manchu minority, which completely mm -hmm. lost its standing after the revolution overthrew the um, uh, the Manchu Qing dynasty. So yeah, he comes back to China. He's thoroughly uh, disillusioned with things and picks satire as his um, his way to kind of vent his feelings. And I have to say, I kind of sympathize because um, my time in China, I left uh, the UK 2014 and then made my basically made my return 2018. And in the UK and the Western world at large, things got significantly worse, I, I would mm -hmm. dare to say in those four years. <laughs> Um, I'd, you know, I'd heard before that, um, the idea that progress is all, you know, history is always marching forwards. Progress is always cumulative. I'd heard that before. I heard, I, sorry, I'd heard criticisms of that before and always kind of thought, oh yeah, it's a valid criticism. But I came back to, um, to Scotland and immediately began to feel, yeah, actually, um, we have gone backwards. Things are getting worse and there's no reason to think they might not get worse. And I got quite fed up for a while and did look for either creative channels or reading and, and films to kind of vent about how fed up I was with my reverse culture shock. I've Thankfully, I've mellowed out now. Whether or not things will get better, I don't know. But um, yeah, I think the kind of negativity in cat country about the author's home country is maybe this, this is not a particularly original thought i'm having here but it's important to set it in the context of his return to a country um in in trouble mm, absolutely definitely it's uh it's um sorry just thinking about how negative it is it's so negative i'm yeah. just gonna let me just sorry i gotta just get more comfortable in my chair um i know it'll make a squeaky noise so <laughs> I, in um, like my second episode the chair i was oh. sitting in collapsed and it was so it? Good that I, uh, <laughs> second or third episode i think the oh, chair dude. collapsed but it was oh, so no. it was so good i kept it in the show oh really <laughs> yeah mm. so listeners can can search back in the episode history for that one um <laughs> I've not read anything else by Lao Shu. Have you read any of his other writing? Um, I haven't, um, but I would really like to after reading this book. And I'm sure it'll all be just as... Um, well, I, I was going to say it'll be just as negative, um, but I don't think it will, actually, because from what I've heard, all of his other uh, you know, writing is quite funny and humorous, um, mm. much more than this one, um, which I think was uh, heavily criticised for its lack of humour, was it not? Yes, yeah, mm. and... In that essay I mentioned, um, the one that Lao wrote himself, kind of um, apologizing um, or an, an, an apology in like the literary sense for the, for the um, novel, he explained that he felt one of the shortcomings was his choice to try and not use uh, humor. And he felt, I think in hindsight, his feeling was a, a good satire should use humor in a, at least in a balanced way. And I, by trying to not use any kind of erred in the wrong direction although we could probably talk about the humor later because i mm. i maybe was seeing some stuff perhaps i was projecting it but there was some stuff i found really blackly funny um speaking of kind of <laughs> blackly funny i have a really good story about consuming other stuff by lao shu mm. so when i was living in shanghai um i had this fellow foreign friend he was an american guy called adam i might have told the story on previous episodes but hopefully not every listener um will catch me out on that mm. He told me, "Oh, I've been, um, I've got my hands on uh, tickets for a, a, a play here in Shanghai. It's by Lao Shu. You know, you've heard of Lao Shu." And I was like, hey, "Yes, I know the name. I think he'd. Um, I forget if he had um, bought them for a date and then been cancelled on or what. But he had a spare ticket, <laughs> and he asked me if I wanted to come along on a, a mate mm -hmm. date. And I said, "Yeah. Um, why are you going though? Like, we we're both learning Chinese. Neither of us were really good enough to follow a play. But he said." Um, he said, don't worry, this thing will have subtitles, just like, you know, you've seen in theatres where there's a play in mm -hmm. English and they put Chinese subs on a thing along the bottom. This is going to have English subs. And I, I said, oh, you're, you're certain? And he's like, yeah, 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 I was told so. So I trusted that and we showed up and it was our Ma, uh, Mr. Ma and Son by Lao Shu. Oh, and we sat the whole way through and there was no subs. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, that sounds, what was the set, kind of set and the scenery like? Because that's set in the UK, isn't it? Yes, um, although did they I get that quite accurate, or well, I sat the whole way through seeing a lot of Western stuff and Western themes, but with a cast of all Chinese actors and <laughs> trying to guess exactly what, why there was so much Christian, why there was a priest, mm. why there was Christian stuff, and then read the blurb later, and yeah, it's it's set in London. It's about a Chinese shopkeeper and his son, and their Mister Ma and son, and it's about their. I don't really know what they got up to. I would. Only... <laughs> 
<laughs> um, there was um, highs and lows. That's what I could tell you from mm. sat through the thing. We were too embarrassed to just walk out. Oh no, but um, that, that sounds, I mean, I, because um, Lausha, he wrote um, both novels and plays, didn't he? I think one of his most mm. famous um, uh, plays is Tea House. Um, yep. And as, as it's, it's translated into English, um, but it'd be quite interesting to see how um, some of his novels have been adapted into um, you know, plays and, and kind of mm. theatrical uh, spectacles. And um, so I know that um, Cat Country has in a few cases. Um, yeah which is which is quite interesting yeah i read there was a play a, a production of it in 2013 so that would be mm. um chinese leo Shin's three body problem would have um exploded in china by then and new chinese sci new wave chinese sci-fi had really taken off so i wonder if that play was put on in in, the, in that context if it was like the oh, revival mm. of sci-fi fandom I, I don't know it would be Perhaps, if, anyone, yeah. if anyone listening knows, please do please do get in touch. But yeah, um, mm. that, that was my question about Lao Shu's other writing. I guess neither of us are experts, but that's good because this isn't really supposed to be uh, an expert show. This is uh, um, just a show about enjoying and reading stuff. <laughs> we have both done. Um, I, my next question was going to be about um, the legacy and perception of cat country at home and abroad. I can't claim to know a lot. I know it got reviewed not so well when it first came out i know that lausher wrote that essay apologizing for it i know it was much better received in translation mm -hmm. and then it's been translated into quite a lot of different languages and that various critics maybe mostly foreign critics have said the novel's better than lausher said it was and there was some speculation Lausha might have been downplaying it either to appease his critics or for political reasons because he came under fire um, after the revolution for not being ideological enough. Do you, do you know much more about how this book's disseminated um, uh, for, over the years and the decades? Um, I So I don't. I know that, um, as you mentioned, so um, Lausha came under kind of very uh, heavy criticism from um, you know members of the communist party and uh, the red guards in particular you know for um some of his writings and so i can imagine um you know this book being you know not very humorous and uh, and really coming down quite hard on china um would not have been well it wasn't right it wasn't very well except it wasn't published um after uh, 1949 from what i understand mm -hmm. um but yeah, I think um, obviously Laosha has now sort of been reinstated as a uh, great literary figure in China. So um, I can imagine that, of course, I don't think it's one of his most um, popular works, but I certainly think it's up there because he did write quite a lot. Uh, in terms of like how popular it is outside of China, again, I, I'm, I'm sure people, uh, you know, studying Chinese literature may have heard of it, but I don't think that. I mean, anybody I've spoken to who, you know, is um, into classical literature, they still haven't heard of this book, to be honest. So, yeah, I, that's all I can really say about that. It's more just, mm. um, yeah, not very insightful. I do apologise. It's but, okay. I'm hardly yeah. an expert either. <laughs> one thing I remembered from one of those essays I read, um, which I'll give links to in, in the show notes. Um, I think they're both behind paywalls. Um I may, I may have, uh, I may have a way to help people read them, though. I'll, I'll say no more than that. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, the the thing which I've just remembered is that the there was a, some sort of a statement from um, I don't know some arm of the Chinese government or uh, maybe a, a a journal, a government literary journal, um, a, a, sorry, a state literary journal um, in 1970, because 1970 was the year that uh, Lyle. Uh, the translator who um, did the English translation that we both read did his work. He translated Mao Chongji into English, into cat country. And wh whichever publication it was in China said something like, How, of, of course, the capitalist foreign dogs chose this work to translate. The whole thing is a tract <laughs> against Marxism, <laughs> Leninism, which it is not. Mm -hmm. But it does it does make fun mm -hmm. of um, communism and communism of like, maybe like, 20s 30s china mm. um and i was also thinking um as as you as as you were speaking so cat country is not banned in, in china today but then again mm. it's criticizing a very distant past and a past that you know the chinese communist party is not responsible for because it's well before they when they took power but i was thinking if a chinese sci-fi writer was to write something that was this negative about 
Xi Jinping era China and is miserable about its prospects and its people, I don't really see it getting published in China. No, I, I can't either. Can you imagine? Like, if no. that came out, um, no, I can't imagine anything like that getting published today. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, I yeah. can't see the author getting in trouble, but I do see no publisher wanting to take it. And I, mm. or maybe publishers getting in trouble if they published it because yeah, it's not, it's not what you'd call a patriotic work by any stretch no, of exactly. imagination. No, um, no but as you say, this, this book, um, yeah, yeah, as you mentioned, even though it does poke fun at, um, kind of, yeah, Marxist, Leninist, uh, you know, uh, of that kind of ideology back in, um, when Laosha was writing, I think today he's, uh, kind of considered to be this figure that, again, loved China, and he was just trying to do his best to you know, spur on the, the youth of China and the people to do better, and I think he's, um, kind of highlighted as a patriot nowadays, right, mm. he's, you know, somebody who um, was kind of doing you know, this critical work for the greater good, in a sense. But definitely, if, if something like that was published today, I think, yeah, nobody would take it on. Nobody no would chance. think it was for the greater good, yeah. <laughs> um, no. So, yeah, it's quite interesting how that is, uh, how that is today. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so let's hop in our proverbial podcast spaceship and look at the novel itself. Let's take mm-hmm. a step precariously onto cat country so i think we've given the elevator pitch i think we can skip that i guess i'll just describe the opening um the opening scene because it's a pretty good scene and it Mm. gives us and the the scenes to follow kind of set us up for what's to come so the very first sentence the first chapter although i should say these chapter titles were added uh to the english translation the first chapter uh, in the english translation is called the crash And our first sentence is, the spacecraft was a total loss. And then we learn that our traveler's friend has been killed in the crash. We learn he's landed on Mars. And the first thing that happens to him is he's attacked by like a alien species of carrion bird. And he's rescued by some cat people. He rescues some other, I forget the exact circumstances, but he rescues a cat person by using the gun he's brought with him. And the gun gives him an awful lot of prestige, but also he gets an awful lot of prestige by virtue of being a foreigner. And if you've ever been a foreigner in China, uh, especially someone like myself um, of very little economic worth who went off there to talk English, uh, not talk English, (laughs) well, in some ways talk English, uh, (laughs) teach English, you immediately find yourself to be a... a very you can get a lot of a lot of praise um and a lot of a lot of pay for not doing very much and that's what happens to our uh, chinese protagonist here he's taken on by a warlord or a local kind of power who's kind of a a stand in for the warlords of the chinese warlord period and he kind of becomes like his bodyguard and that's his in and yeah from there on in the plot's kind of episodic unstructured it's kind of like like you were saying how there's a theme of exploration in the story Mm-hmm. We're really we're kind of just the the incidents the uh, our main character encounters are kind of just an excuse for an exploration of the the, the cat country and, and the society. So yeah, I don't think we can pitch from the elevator any more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, are, are we good to go on to the next question? Would you say? Uh, yeah, I think so. Although I, I perhaps it might be good to mention that um, I think the first half of this book is largely set in a kind of rural landscape right. um, yeah. of this country. And then halfway through, we get to um, the capital city of Cat Country and it all starts to get quite shambolic from there. And uh, I think that's when it becomes the most depressing, actually, for me. That's when I have to take certainly more breaks just to have a breather um, from all the yeah yeah descriptive i think you're right and you've just reminded me of a line um so there is a chapter the english edition titles it the capital of cat country and the first sentence of that chapter goes like this as soon as i set eyes on cat city for some reason or other a sentence took form in my mind this civilization will soon perish Mm. and yeah you're right it gets um we we went from kind of like absurdity or absurdity in the countryside and um the stupidity of the sky scorpion and then we go from kind of almost lightheartedness to some really bleak scenes in the city and the people we meet are worse they're in bigger groups and it's I, i forget what the name for that formula is but like you can divide the iq of a crowd is something like the iq of their highest member divided by the numbers of people there's a lot of like horrible <laughs> mob scenes in cat city mm, definitely that's uh definitely there's a um 
the scene I think of when he first describes cat country that really sticks in my mind um when he's talking about the the streets and the layout of the streets um do you remember that that part quite well yeah can you mm. what's up with the streets can you remember so it's just that they're these um it, just, it sounds so nightmarish it almost sounds like a, a kind of dream that you, know, that you can't escape from it's these enormous streets that are really really wide um and so the houses are very far apart from from each other there's these kind of like lines of houses but the houses themselves are um described as having no windows or doors just these four walls and in order to get into the house you have to climb up the walls and kind of drop yourself in right they've got no, no ceiling and then these streets even though they're very wide they're full of cat people and the narrator in the book Kind of, what does he say? He says that if you were to like leave your house, you wouldn't be able to pick which direction you you were going to go, and you just have to kind of ride the wave of all these cat people. And if perhaps two cat people decide to stop for a chat, um, it that leads to more and more cat people behind them building up until there are these waves of of cats <laughs> and it just sounds nightmarish and I think there's a part where it says oh if you you, know, you might even not get back to your house the same day because it really just depends on where the wave takes you that sounds awful doesn't it and, and that really sticks with me that that scene in particular um because we've gone yeah. from this kind of rural countryside that again is a bit silly to this very crowded space um and I can imagine that uh you know that is some kind of slight on uh you know, streets in China in the 1930s and how crowded they perhaps were. Mm, there's a scene that I remember. It's I think it's like the procession of some kind of important person through the street and people are kind of, um, there's a bit of push and shove. People are yelling at him and his bodyguards or the police or whoever they are kind of step in to push back the crowd and they have these big batons or something and they start bashing the ordinary <laughs> cat people on the head. Mm. But the cat ordinary cat people just keep smiling and the protagonist is like, what why are why are they just taking it why are they smiling but at the same time he's struck by a thought and he thinks if there was just some decent good-hearted ruler here kind of like um, a, a good confucian ruler in in like the classic sense this could be a really good place um but the the people who just go along with whatever is happening have a very kind of um go for flow attitude are being led by people who maybe um have only themselves in mind there was um one of the articles i read was analyzing it's an, it was analyzing the laws of cat country and saying while a lot of the laws are kind of implemented with the intention of benefiting people or even they do benefit people allowed when they're allowed to play out or when you follow them to their logical conclusion they bring about the downfall of the country so there's one of the um the laws that the well, we should, I should probably explain here that the, the economy is based on these things called reverie leaves, which are basically, it's a metaphor for opium. The whole country is based on them. They're the national food. The reason they're the national food is at first the government of cat country tried to ban the reverie leaves because they see they, they could see they were causing problems. But on the first day of the ban, the rulers and all the people just ignored the ban, kept eating. So the government thought, right, we need to pass a better law. Let's uh, legalize the reverie leaves. And then I think theft or the ownership of the reverie lease became a problem. They were accumulating in the hands of too few people or whatever. So the government passes a law and decriminalize, decriminalizes the theft of the leaves. And, you know, everyone can have all the leaves they want. But of course, in the long term, all the kind of things that were holding society together blow away in the wind there's probably other examples of that i can think of but um i know i'm not i'm not trying to say anything too general or too negative or dismissive or anything about um my experiences in modern china but there's a word you learn as a foreigner troubled war which means something like more or less <laughs> And I feel like I don't know if troubled war was a phrase in in um, the China of Lao Shou's time, but a lot of the awful stuff that happens seems to be a, a consequence of kind of like a not necessarily malicious attitude, but a kind of a mm, whatever troubled war mm. go attitude that's destroying the country and making everything meaningless. And I wonder if I get the feeling anyway that's something Lao Shou really didn't like. And I get the feeling he wasn't just trying to attack troubled wall laws he was trying to attack something and what he was seeing in like the 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 national character and mm -hmm. yeah definitely. i've really i've really gone on a long tangent there no oh, no i think it's a good point um definitely because uh, this landlord who he becomes uh, you know the bodyguard for he has a son in the book doesn't he um i think it's so the name of the landlord is scorpion and his mm. son they call him young scorpion um 
I think that's right, young scorpion. Um, yes, young scorpion. The Chinese one, it's it's little scorpion. Yeah, so right. young scorpion. He um he uh he was, he's talking to young scorpion and um yeah this guy so this cat is kind of just like yeah well you know we just muddle along essentially and this narrator's like M- yeah muddling along like what, what are you talking about you can't muddle along in this kind of society something needs to be done right and um uh, yeah so I think you, you, you're you right about this kind of chapter uh, attitude um that they have yeah it's like what are you doing you can't muddle along and young scorp young scorpion is like yes I can watch me yeah <laughs> <laughs> the- yeah and the funny thing is, although that you 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 made it sound like he's just another ignoramus, he's actually probably the smartest of the cat people we meet. Um, he's kind of the maybe the flavor of intellectual who realizes just how far gone things are and decides, look, what 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 am I going to achieve by trying to modernize or improve anything? Mm. I'm just going to I'm going to kind of you know if there's a if there's a hedonistic shallow tendency in society whatever that could benefit me i could have a nice mm. life here um even if the greater whole falls apart but yeah i i find my i find myself kind of liking young scorpion um for one reason that he he was just kind of an of an equal intelligence with the uh with the narrator unlike pretty much every other uh cat person but at the same time, like he, he seemed like a believable sort of, he seems like a decent person who's resigned themselves to a not very decent situation. Whereas like his yeah. dad, Scorpion, is just a prick, basically. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And um, so uh, he's described as a pessimist, isn't he? This is how the narrative yeah. describes him. He says, oh, you know, he's a pessimist, but he still seems to, uh, you know, respect this this guy and then um, you know, friends him and uh are we allowed to do spoilers in this podcast <laughs> oh we already have yeah oh no, fantastic so um so in the end uh you know this young scorpion ends up uh, killing himself doesn't he and his, his partner his girlfriend or um and uh, our narrator is obviously very upset by this and uh you know because i think he yeah, obviously did respect the as you say the intelligence of this this guy and um really didn't want him to you know kind of succumb to the end of um the civilization you know we kind of be brought down along with this cat city because he could precisely see you know the intelligence and um uh, in this guy you know and perhaps that i think he saw maybe some promise in him if he wasn't so pessimistic um this intelligence that he had could have been used to lead you know civilization to something a bit greater um yeah i, I think anyway <laughs> yeah there's a huge yeah. huge feeling of waste throughout everything but mm. especially in the city um my next question was going to be like uh, which which scenes or which uh situations really stick with you um mm. we've we've kind so, of kind of already mm. got into that but let's keep going what what mm. stuff really sticks with you here in the, in there's, a, there's a few things i mean i think it all i mean as you say it's it's a the, there's not really that much plot to it and the characters i don't think are that well developed and again that's something that i think the book was um you know, people picked up on um uh, it was kind of like a criticism of the book um but then again there's this whole oh, if you think it's a, a satire then you don't really need to develop the characters that well but, um, anyway uh, that's a whole other thing about the character development but um so in terms of what stuck with me, I think so much. Um, I think the, one of the first uh, things that stuck with me was, um, I was again, this, this kind of description of the cat city and these streets and um, the scenery that was described as being in this country. I think even though I found them a bit of a struggle to get through, some chapters in this in this English version just appear to be rants um, about uh, China um, as it was when Laosha was around. Um, so we have a big uh, long speech by um, I think it's the wife of the ambassador, um, and then we have a big long speech by a uh, young scorpion um, who's almost moved kind of close to tears. Um, how poorly his his civilization is doing um and then i think uh, uh, something that really sticks in my mind is the ending how a cat country eventually um fell and was overtaken by these foreign countries and then just how it ends how how suddenly and abruptly it ends um mm. so uh, we have this obviously this kind of scene where um the last two cats uh, alive are put in a cage and they tear each other apart essentially ending um you know their own civilization and then the narrator is like oh and then a couple months later um uh, a french 
spaceship flew by and I went home the end <laughs> essentially and it's very very um it ends very abruptly I think that that's actually quite um it works quite well um because I think it leaves the it certainly left me sort of still reeling from what I had just read and it didn't really sugarcoat anything or, or kind of leave any um you know positive or hopeful message it was very much just like yeah and that was that that was the end of this civilization um and then I went back to China, where it's a much better country. <laughs> and so that, that's something that will um, stick with me, I think, for a, mm. for a long time, because it, it did shock me a little bit, um, yeah. in a good way. Mm. The end is, um, I was mentioning earlier, there's parts of the story that are kind of prophetic of um, things to come in the Cultural Revolution. Well, I feel like that end bit you were describing, there's a scene or two that, in a way, could be you could read it as eerily, um, an eerie premonition of some of the atrocities that were going to happen when China was invaded by Imperial Japan. I'd be thinking most of um, the um, the rape of Nanjing uh, or the Nanjing massacre, as as you know, is also known, um, where an an unspecified foreign country invades um, the elite or or the the young kind of whatever the cat country equivalent of like the leftist revolutionaries are. They figure, well, if we um, if we kill our leaders, then the invaders will see that we're um, on their side and. As a, as a bonus, we overthrow the ruling class. Let's do that. But it doesn't work. The invaders keep coming for them anyway. And unlike um, unlike China, which did survive World War II and one way or another did come out on top of the invaders, cat country doesn't. Um, the invaders completely own uh, the cat people. So we, we get this um, scene of the men, women, and children of cat people being shoveled into a mass grave. You know, mm. you go in thinking it's going to be a nice story in space about uh, cats in space <laughs> and a mass grave finishing off the book. Mm. Um, I'm just going to read the last two paragraphs with that scene you mentioned of the, the cats in the cage because this bit really st- sticks in my mind. And we can also maybe we can prove to the, the listeners who really aren't joking about how abruptly this thing ends. So mm. uh, if you'll allow the indulgence here, I'll just read the last uh, section of the book. Spoilers, obviously, because it's the end. (laughs) If I were to describe everything that I saw that day, I would weep myself blind, for those short enemy soldiers were the cruelest people I had ever seen. The destruction of cat country was now complete. I even doubt that very many of their flies were left. Towards the end, I actually saw a few cat people try to resist, but even then, they could only manage to band together in groups of three or five at the most. On the very brink of death, they still didn't understand the need for cooperation. Later, on a small mountain, I ran into ten or so cat people who had escaped. It was the only spot that had yet not been that had not yet been occupied by the enemy soldiers. But before three days were out, even this group of refugees had begun fighting each other, so that over half of them were already dead. Before the enemy troops arrived in the area, the, the group was down to two. They must have been the last two survivors in all of cat country. By the time the enemy arrived, these two were locked in mortal combat. Rather than killing them, the enemy soldiers locked them in a large wooden cage where they continued their struggle until they had bitten each other to death. In this way, the cat people themselves completed their own destruction. We have a little ornamental break, and then we have the last paragraph. After living on Mars for another half year, I encountered a French exploration craft and thus was able to return alive to my own great, glorious and free China. The end. And you're like, you're, as the reader, you're like, oh, oh God. Um, oh yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the reaction I had. I was very uh, uh, speechless, I think. Mm. I think it's... I, I was, I, mm. Sorry, what were you going to say? Oh no, I think I was just... I remember being like, oh, is that is that it? And I was looking for more pages and you know, it kind of dawned on me, oh, that really is it. That is the ending. That's it for Very the cats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting that the, one of the problems that we're showing again and again in cat countries is a total lack of solidarity or, or cohesion or a vision of a, like a greater goal. And I think that's interesting because these days, a cliche that you'll hear from Westerners and from Chinese people is, oh, uh, people in the West, they're individualistic, they can't cohere. And um, the people of China, um, they have, you know, they can put themselves aside and think of themselves as a greater whole. And it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's a total cliche. And yet the truth does seem to be kind of bearing out, perhaps, if you look at it from the right angle. Mm. And yet, like in this story, love 
one of Laoshu's whole points is, God damn it, these cat people, they can't even coexist in a group. They don't even have a, they don't, they can't even grasp the concept of like cooperation. And there's, there's a bit early on where we learn that in Thelanese, the language of the cat people, the word freedom is actually, I'm going to look it up because it's, it's quite funny. The word freedom has a subtly different definition, which takes this wonderful idea and um, flips it so that it's a, uh, awful let me let me try and find this i'm just gonna pause here yeah so i i managed to find the um Filoni's definition of freedom i think it's expressed most concisely in some of the secondary reading i did so i'll just read uh, from from that briefly it goes like this for cat people freedom is the highest ideal in life but freedom in Filoni's means taking advantage of others being non-cooperative creating disturbances the concept of freedom, therefore, is actually selfishness carried to the extreme. This ideal makes the citizens consider yielding the right of way to be something most disgraceful. In effect, everyone enjoys blocking the other's way. So I think that, that comes back to what you said about the crowds and the complete lack of... Um, <laughs> the, the, the cat people aren't even able to walk the streets effectively because mm. everyone's putting themselves first. I think that's... That, <laughs> um, I was just going to say, um, I think that also comes uh, back quite nicely to what you said about how when people are reading this book, even if they might not know anything about Chinese literature and culture history, um, they might be able to identify um, parts of their own you know, modern day culture in that. And I think um, when you were reading that, I was thinking, mm. oh, that does sound a lot like today um, or a number of different things. Um, <laughs> I think uh, particularly now that we're in this uh, pandemic mode and we do see a lot of people um, uh, you know, talking about their personal freedoms and they should be able to do this, that or the other, um, you know, um, that, that might be you know, something somebody might be able to relate to. Yeah, um, like the misapplication of freedom um, and or if we're looking at it another way, the total kind of not a sudden loss, but from from one point of view the idea of like any cohesive society has mm. been dissolving for a long time and the consequence of that is everyone exists as an atomized individual and i feel like in in cat country maybe people aren't thinking of themselves in such lofty terms maybe the people don't even respect themselves enough to be atomized individuals but like the idea of a cohesive whole where you can put aside your own your own like immediate short term goals deferring your short-term goals either to other people or even to your old long-term goals is non-existent everyone is just kind of wandering about <laughs> like a toddler just seeking into instant gratification and yeah like it doesn't i don't see why that should apply to any one society it kind of just seems like a description of a, mm. a society in decline and yeah it is it what does it say about the uk the us where there are people who either don't care or don't want to know about why they should be following lockdown when a global pandemic's going on like it's mm. totally detached from reality if you ask me definitely. people would do that definitely. so yeah that's a really interesting um uh, definition within the book and um sorry i didn't i wasn't gonna say anything i was just like mm, i've uh, <laughs> i've uh sorry i'm gonna let you mm. take the conversation or lead the conversation yeah keep it keep it moving honestly i mm. do that all the time i'll go like hmm yeah and I think if I was a more experienced podcaster, that's where I just say interesting. And then go to the next <laughs> question. But yeah, um, yeah, interesting. Next question. Um, what do you think of the cat people? Rather than like trying to do sociological commentary on them, what if we take a sci-fi angle here mm. or just looking at representation in general? What do you think of them as aliens in a sci-fi mm. novel? Um, well, uh... I think that it does strike me as something that is present in a more, uh, I suppose, softer science fiction novel. Um, I, I personally, I have a very strong preference for if we're, if I'm going to be um, reading or watching anything about alien life, I like it to be as alien as possible. I think it's always a bit of a, I think it's strange if we, and I remember having a, a disagreement with somebody about this. Um, they said, of course, um, you know, life, um, it's going to all be, it's all going to develop in a very similar way. You know, if, so for instance, if a creature is going to be able to um, 
come to a to earth for example they would have um you know like limbs and hands and able to like put these things together a similar kind of way of thinking and so on and so forth but I disagreed with that um I mm. think that I, I, I think I prefer it when alien life is depicted as being more alien um uh, you know as far removed from humanity as possible because I think that's more interesting and I think that anything that is too I suppose close to humanity I just see it as being like a human creation and instead of more of a human creation and a bit more fictional than uh, you know than I would what am I trying to say so I would be less inclined to find it believable if that makes sense yeah yeah um so with these cats then again I didn't really mind that they were cats um in this book because I didn't really view it as again while I say I think it can be categorized as a science fiction novel um in a sense I certainly don't think that it is primarily a science fiction uh novel they actually the kind of thing I had in mind with these cats were you mentioned the studio Ghibli movies um yeah and one of them is uh oh the cat returns that's it and Mm -hmm. I remember the scene um, where the main character, uh, she, so she ends up saving this cat and then um, at night this parade of cats comes along to um, thank her and that's kind of what I had in mind when, um, that's what I thought they looked like, um, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of standing up on two legs and sort of waddling along almost, Um, that's kind of what I thought of them. Um, yeah. What about you? What, what, did, what did you have in mind when you thought about them? Or what, what do you think of them as kind of aliens? Or, or what, what were your thoughts generally about yeah. them? Yeah, um, I like it when listeners um, fire the question back at me. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's good um, because it gives, me, it, it gives me a prompt. I don't just have to um, think really hard about what to say. I, I have a, a, like a, what do you call it, a, a launch pad. So yeah. In. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so weirdly enough, I watched... The Cat Returns relatively recently, but not so recently that I could have called it prep for the show. And yeah, mm-hmm. like, through all of, all of the film bar one scene, I wasn't thinking about Cat Country, but there was one scene. Oh, wait, I'm going to pause here. My, I forgot to plug my laptop in and the battery's nearly dead. Oh, no. I'm going to restart this question after I've plugged in. Sorry about that. That's all right. Let's see. Amateurish of me. <laughs> not at all. Oh, there we go it's plugged back in mm-hmm. it would have been like appropriately cat country-ish if i had like just never noticed it wasn't plugged in and then <laughs> laptop died mm. and then i i did publish the episode but it's an episode that just cuts out halfway through and i'm like ah it's just a chubbled wall whatever yeah exactly mm. but yeah um so as i was saying um there was one scene in the cat returns where i was like oh what it's cat country and that was that exact scene you mentioned really that's the, so interesting yeah. mm. Mm. well i think there's a reason for it because the the king of the cats shows up and he's being carried on a what do you call that when when the king's being carried on on like a stretch a stretcher is not the right word yeah for like a sort of chaise long type chaise, thing yeah he's mm. like like he's lying like a pharaoh or something and the cats are i think are they playing instruments and it's all looking very serious but also very ridiculous mm. at the same time and the when I, i'm pretty sure when scorpion first shows up other maybe not when he first shows up but there is a scene somewhere in the novel where an important cat is being carried on a stretcher and there's lots of uh, fanfare and pomp and that image is on a re- the cover of the book that is the cover mm. of the book it's a procession of humanoid cats in silhouette and one of them's on a stretcher and I do wonder, I think I was wondering when that scene came on, I was like, hang on, did um, Mr. Miyazaki or whoever wrote this film, did they read Cat Country? I mean, it, it doesn't seem inconceivable, but I don't know how you would ever find out. Mm, um, yeah, I guess so. he's still alive, isn't he, Miyazaki? Um, mm, I don't know if yeah, he wrote that I, one. No, I don't. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I don't know either. Um, but yeah, I think the reason I had that image um, is precisely because it's on the front cover and I think or at least of this um, Penguin Classics version and that's what mm. I think came to mind that's why I imagined them to be like that or at least I did I imagined them to be again this kind of cartoonish silly 
um, you know, a depiction of cats or you know, kind of cat-like people walking on all twos until about halfway through, it, which is when you know we start to get sort of more of the misery and the and the corruption, and, and we get more into um, how you know terrible the civilization is. And uh, for me, this sort of kind of cat-like facade started to really melt away, and right. um, and I, th that's when I kind of started to really just think oh, okay this is you know this is china basically when when laoshu was writing this these are no longer these cute cuddly cat things and i so i had a really interesting um debate because i was talking to my mum about this book uh, this was again before um i had read that uh, the cats you know could have just been replaced with anything like rabbits or um any other animal but we were kind of talking oh, why cats why um did uh Lausha decide to depict them a cat uh, as cats and so i said i thought it was because um he wanted to create this kind of cuddly figure um so we would immediately sympathize with them um we also cats as you mentioned already um are very present within our society and also chinese society their pets mm. um and so even if we don't you know necessarily have a cat or like cats there's still this societal you know kind of uh, i think agreement that we protect them we care for them and they exist within our society so we identify with them in a sense they, they there are these links to cats in our own society and um mm -hmm. so i thought that it was a way of making the audience i suppose want these cat people to do well and kind of want them to want to see them thrive and again perhaps with them being cats at first it would lure the audience into thinking that they were more oh it would lure the audience into uh thinking oh this is just a cuddly cat you know novel and then eventually when you get halfway through you're like oh actually um there's some real serious uh, criticisms in here um so that's what i thought but then my mom said um she what did she say she said um cats they are cute and there is as you say as well this idea of this kind of cute funny um cat caricature that's quite present in um you know the asian uh, east asian um region mm. but cats ultimately are very selfish um she said that they're loners um they're very sly and um first and foremost we often forget that they are predators um, mm -hmm. And so she thought that they were depicted as cats precisely because um, Laoshu wanted to get across the point that these are these very um, you know, selfish, individualistic um, type characters. And she kind of contrasted it with dogs. She said, oh, dogs are very friendly to one another, whereas cats, um, uh, I think she said that they're a bit more prone to, you know, being a bit, what's the word I'm looking for? Slippery? Slippery, yes, perhaps slippery is the right word, <laughs> yeah. So we had a nice talk about that, and then later on I read, oh, it could just be anything. But, um, mm, although, do we trust Laosha when he says that? Is it, or is he just, is he just kind of being rhetorical and provocative? So like, who knows? Who knows why he? Who knows if we should trust him when he said that? Mm, exactly. It does seem a little bit perfect in some ways that he chose cats. If it was bunnies, like every animal has its own connotations, and I was wondering when I when I mentioned the cute cats of you know China, Japan, East Asia. I don't know if that was a thing in, in how much that was a thing in the 30s. It certainly wasn't what it is now. But, you know, even even if the kind of kawaii cat hadn't conquered China in 1930s, every animal in literature always has some kind of significance. And even if you do pick one just randomly because you've just bought a pet cat, people are going to interpret it a particular way. You can't escape that. And, you know, if, if we're being Freudians, you might have an, an unconscious reason for choosing it that you weren't aware of. And yet, on some level you did choose because it was appropriate so yeah mm. um i think everything you and both you and your mom's way of reading it could be totally valid are are totally valid and you know if he, he thought it was a bad book himself when he was writing about it afterwards what if he'd called it uh i don't know um frog country or <laughs> um mm. seagull country it would probably be even worse i think he's made a fairly good choice as an author um, just by picking cats I think so. I definitely. I can't even imagine what it would be like with frogs, frog people, or I don't think rabbits would be right either because I think they're reserved more for the moon, or at least that's how I think of them now. Right, yeah. Uh, she, yeah, Chinese um, culture. So, yeah, I, I agree that cats is quite a perfect choice, or at least was here. Um, really kind of gets the slinkiness of these these cats across quite well, I think. Mm. Well, I feel like there's, the, well, I know that the, there's a bit early on 
where Lausha kind of gives a very detailed description of how the cat's faces look. And it's clearly not an actual cat face. It's like a weird humanoid cat fusion thing. And mm. the mental image I was getting in my head was like really like unsettling and weird. I felt like that yeah. he was like he was describing the cats can't look you in the eye. They're very slippery. And I, I, I got, okay, he's doing like a, he's using the description as a way to build up the collective character of these um, these creatures in a way that makes them seem like untrustworthy, hard to pin down and so on. Mm. But as I, I kind of wish he hadn't, over described the cat i wish he'd done like the um striking the balance between leaving it to our imagination and giving us some or giving our imagination something to work with because mm. i would have rather have imagined them to be more sort of cartoony rather than like the very kind of hyper almost like hyper real hyper detailed description he gave left me not really wanting to root for the cats but then maybe that was <laughs> the intention in the first place mm, yeah they are very um it's almost like a weird uncanny valley kind of mm. um idea of a cat and again i don't know if that was purposeful um you know to kind of make us feel a bit uncomfortable and unsettled from the get-go but i i agree i certainly was a bit uh, i felt a bit uncomfortable <laughs> this idea of these very um yeah, very overly described, hyper-realistic cat. Yeah, especially like. since the things they engage in are so, like, oh, human all too human. They horribly mm. murder each other. Um, the um, the male cats of the cat cat people are... What's the, they're, they're, a lot of them are horrible perverts. Um, mm. You know, things we you wouldn't really want a cute animal to be getting up to, but Lausha doesn't really hold back. Um, which kind of leads me nicely or not to the next question. Did you find did you find the book funny at all? Because Lausha seems to think he purposely avoided humor, but I wonder like if different readers will see different things. Like, did you see any really black or absurd or whatever comedy here, or was it pretty straight faced and serious to you? Um, I think um there was a scene that I did find quite funny, um, and it did give a little chuckle out of me it was when our main character is swimming in this lake and he kind of looks up and he sees all these cat people watching him um and then his landlord kind of pops up out of nowhere and starts trying to sell these um reverie leaves onto all these um onlookers and uh trying to take advantage of uh you know the situation this the spectacle of this alien man you know having a, a bath in uh in this lake or wherever it is and I thought that was quite funny just because the main character was so outraged wasn't he he was like the audacity of this this landlord cat how dare he um mm. so I thought that was quite uh that was quite funny um but even then um he once he gets out of the water um all the cats kind of freak out and end up trampling each other uh, to death or at least some of the um, onlookers there are trampled to death so it does go downhill it gets quite bleak pretty quickly um but apart from that um there was a scene where um as the city is kind of falling to these foreign invaders um uh, reverie the, the the girlfriend of um young scorpion she says oh let's go and listen to some opera and uh, you know the main character is kind of like oh it was terrible I don't know what this noise is and um that kind of made me laugh because it made me think of you know um, Beijing opera which I do I, I I love Beijing opera very much um but of course to you know perhaps a foreign um listener who's never heard it before it's, it's quite strange isn't it um it does just sound like you know, symbols clashing and, and uh shrieking um so those two scenes are kind of the only things that made me again just chuckle a little bit but I uh, everything else was very very dark and I'm, I'm a real big fan of dark um humor um I do appreciate I can appreciate that it was meant to be written as a I suppose a satire a very dark dark satire um again almost like a satire without the humor um but in terms of if I found it funny, um, I found it more nightmarish, I think, than actually mm. funny. Um, but you say you you found some scenes quite funny. Only in like a really black sense. Like, mm. yeah, not really laugh out loud funny, but just like, oh, oh, no. You know, when you, you kind of you see something so awful and you go, oh, mm. no, but you kind of are somewhat, <laughs> it tickles you somewhere. You're you're. Mm inner misanthrope is like yep i knew it i knew people suck this much oh no i'm just <laughs> watching and seeing how how bad it is 
Mm, it does um, just keep descending, doesn't it? And just more and more when you think it can't get any worse. It's, uh, there's always something else. Yeah, I'm worried I may have revealed something <laughs> rather, um, you know, it's something rather nasty about myself. But there you go. Um, <laughs> what was I going to say? Oh, dear. What was it? Let me think. Yeah, the, what you were saying about the finding the scene funny when our, our our hero goes for a wee swim and then suddenly there's a crowd staring at him Th- those those scenes early on having having spent so i was in shanghai for most of my time in china and if you're a foreigner in shanghai you don't tend to get stared at because foreign faces are a feature of life there but my first year i was in a small town in Zhejiang province and i travel quite a lot in china and i kind of have been in situations similar to to the a protagonist here where you're an object of fascination despite just <laughs> you're just going about your business and i kind of wonder um if laosha maybe experienced the flip side of that um as a as a chinese man in in the uk we might try and flatter ourselves and think oh london must have been so metropolitan when when he mm. was there i'm sure it was no big deal that he had a, a you know a, a clearly foreign face wandering about the city but number one we shouldn't we shouldn't assume too much about how cosmopolitan London was back then and how, how used to different faces people were. But also we shouldn't assume he only stayed in the really metropolitan areas. He could have mm. gone around. I and I can I can imagine him being gawked at back in his own travels abroad. So yeah. Mm. I don't imagine anyone was trying to sell um reverie leaves. No, no, <laughs> no me. It's an exaggerated satire. Exactly, yeah. I think, uh, again, it was even more just reading it. It's essentially, you know, this landlord cat going around peddling drugs as well. Right. It's, it's, you mm-hmm. know, so <laughs> it's just very outrageous as a, as a scene. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think perhaps, um, again, describing it or kind of looking back in retrospect, it all is quite, um, it, you know, uh, almost baffling to the, yeah, it was to the point where it's funny. Um, but certainly as I was reading some scenes, it just came across as... Uh, depressing I think um definitely there are some quotes uh, like that one you read earlier um about him seeing the cat city first of all and he talks about it being you know a, a city near to its end and um there are certain sentences like that that kind of draw you back and think oh actually yes this is you know this is a very real thing um a very real fear I suppose for uh Lasha back then um so yeah I think um I think uh, is it funny um I can definitely see why uh people complained about it being um you know not very humorous and why um Lauder perhaps felt yeah. like he had to apologize for the, the the pessimism in it um but despite the fact that it is um you know not not particularly funny I still think it's a, a great piece of you know writing particularly um after so long it stands up quite well i think and uh, i think that perhaps is what makes it such a, a good piece of um satire in a sense uh, mm. the fact that it got you know it kind of got a lot uh, almost quite spot on in terms of what it describes speaking of foreigners or foreigners performing mm. a particular role in the, with the, the foreign land they end up in they reminded me actually um there's a little bit of a parallel here in this episode with something I was talking about in a previous episode with a previous guest. Um, so I did an episode with Paul French talking about Lin Yu Tang's Him to Shanghai and basically using that as a jump off point to talk about um, semi-colonial Shanghai, which was maybe not a city on its way to collapse, but as we talked about in the episode, a city with an awful lot of um, moral and organizational shortcomings or put it like that. Um and something Paul, uh, Paul Paul French helped me understand was a reference to Russian soldiers uh, guarding things in, mm. in this poem. And that was a real phenomenon in, in Shanghai and who knows, perhaps other areas with foreign influence in China where um, local, I don't know, big men or whatever, to guard their, their clubs or their businesses, they would hire uh, Russians. Uh, a lot of these Russians were ex-soldiers from the, the White Army who would... Who'd, uh, fled the country um, following the Russian Revolution. But essentially, they were hiring um, a big, stern-looking white guy to guard their door, and that inspired a lot more fear than someone, uh, like a local person they could hire. And we see exactly the same thing very early on in this novel. We see um, our protagonist getting hired by Scorpion to guard the reverie leaves um, because Mm. all the other cat people are terrified of him. So it's not just the fact he has a gun. It's also just by merit of being the scary-looking foreigner. And yeah, he gets... (laughs) 
where whereas those Russian soldiers were probably finding themselves economically implicated in whatever uh, dodgy businesses they were guarding, our our guy here finds himself, you know, part of the reverie leaves economy before he can even catch his breath. So yeah, I, I don't really have a question there. That's just something uh, I was meaning to mention. It, it left my mind, and now it's back. Um, Speaking, yeah, that's very interesting. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> listeners who, who are interested in that and haven't listened to the Paul French uh, Lin Yutang Him to Shanghai episode, check that out. It's actually, it does have, as I was kind of describing there, a few crossover points here with um, uh, Cat Country, and they're not from totally the, the time period each is in isn't isn't that far apart. So the it links up with this episode more more than I would have at first thought. But yeah, um, speaking of um, absolutely nothing, changing the topic completely, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about what you you do. We we, we got oh, onto no. this earlier in the show. Um, well, right at the start, actually, you're you're telling me you study put really babyishly simply um, uh, the Chinese Chinese space policy. So my possibly very stupid question is: Can we connect? cat country to space policy in china specifically the prc because i don't imagine there were many rockets leaving 1930s china and heading into space in the 1930s mm-hmm. you know back then but yeah is there any way um, no matter how um how many degrees of separation we take that we <laughs> draw a line between the spaceship and cat country mm-hmm. and what uh, uh space policy is going on in china today Mm. Um, no, I think it's a very good question. Um, and you're right. Yeah, the, I think the links that can be made, um, if any, are very um, tenuous, I think, because, as you mentioned, there are very large gaps between um, the events mentioned. So, of course, you've got um, a novel like Cat Country. It, we were even debating, can it be considered a science fiction work or not? Um, that was written before um, the establishment of of the PRC and um, while China's space program didn't really begin until the late 1950s China didn't even become a uh, you know what's considered a space power until you know the, the turn of the 21st century so it would seem like these are very um, far apart events um, and even as you mentioned there was a real big uh, gap from when um, Lao Shu wrote Cat Country um, uh, so between when that was published and then um, the kind of next wave of science fiction even. So um, I suppose, yeah, that's all that to say. Um, yeah, I think links are quite slight, but um, I think one thing that's quite interesting to note is that in Cat Country, as mentioned before, um, we have this idea of China eventually becoming this country, even though it's very subtle um, and only kind of mentioned every so often in the mm-hmm. book. Um, China is now this country that has technology in order to send um, its citizens into space. Um, And so I think this idea of space travel is something, even back then it was this indication of a more advanced China um, and a greater China, a better China um, in a a sense. Um, And space travel and space exploration, particularly um, crewed space exploration with humans, is still considered something um, that is almost like the pinnacle of um, technological development in in a country. It's what makes a a country um, sort of a leader in um, technological innovation. If they can send people into space, then, um, you know, they're they're, uh, definitely kind of high up, you know, on the development level, whether, you know, I think um, there's a lot of debate around, you know, is that even true you know it's just kind of pumping a load of money into a space program really a sign of a a technologically developed nation but it does seem to be that um that kind of narrative from the uh u.s soviet space race still is quite persistent today um Mm -hmm. and so china is indeed trying to develop its um you know human space flight program in order to demonstrate to the rest of the world that it is a developed um and modern uh, country at the forefront uh, sorry at the forefront of technical innovation um so i think that's quite interesting um again even though it's quite subtle even back then this idea of um you know a uh, great china is something that includes this technology to send its citizens into faraway places past Earth. So I think that's perhaps one link that we can make um, with, um, mm. you know, uh, thoughts about 
technology back then and, and space travel, even though it wasn't really a thing, as I mentioned, in China until um, the 50s. Also, we have um, uh, a lot more control now over the kind of um, things that are uh, included uh, in literature and creative works can we have China um, so as, as we were talking about earlier you wouldn't be able to have a novel today really um, that really criticizes and picks apart the country and the leadership um, like this this novel right here um, so uh, the kind of new uh, creative policies I think that we were seeing come out of the Chinese government are ones that um, are telling creators to try and encourage the youth of China by presenting China in you know these these works these uh, you know novels and, and films um, so presenting China as something already quite great and um, by by showing that China has come a long way already it's I think trying to encourage the youth uh, or the people of China to continue this trend of um, you know greatness whereas um, Lao Shu, his intention was also the same it was to kind of spur on uh, people of China to create a better China to, to improve the country um, but the difference there is that he instead decided to depict um, the country as something terrible and in and, and, and need of a lot of improvement and he really does just pick apart everything um, the culture society leadership you know within the country within China um, whereas today that that idea of um, encouragement is very different um, and a lot more monitored, I would say. Right. Um, yeah, so <laughs> so that's quite a lot right there, I think. Um, yeah. Again, I, I think uh, perhaps not um, particularly you know, strongly related, but... Um, but it was a good springboard to get us to talk about important stuff. So it did it, the question <laughs> did its job. Um, and what you were saying links me back to something i covered in the show's little opening news segment a few episodes ago so you i sure. know what you're gonna say because i cool. listened to that one yeah? <laughs> no, no, no. Yes. Good. Good, good, good. <laughs> i well, told you i'm a fan uh -huh. mm -hmm. excellent um well mm -hmm. this is actually i'm going to then take it a step further with the, the kind of a, a suspicion i have about something that's also been covered in a, a news segment i did recently so a few episodes ago i covered an announcement or I guess a, an announcement or a post or whatever you would call it that the China China's like film production slash censorship sort of board I forget its name but like the National F Film Organization made and it was a set of guidelines on uh, for the the production of domestic science fiction movies basically is is this is this what did you guess right is, is this is what you thought I was gonna yes say? I, yeah <laughs> right um yeah I was very excited to hear you talk about it um so yeah please please continue because yeah, yeah. Um, it's fascinating yeah yeah and another piece of news I covered possibly in the next episode I think um was about the news that the three body problem film adaptation has been taken up by Netflix and the two guys mm. who adapted Game of Thrones uh D and D as they're known I forget exactly mm -hmm. something vice something something those two guys anyway they're going to be doing net uh, they're going to be doing three body and it's going to be on Netflix and this is after a long series of like fits and starts the three body problem adaptation was originally going to be done like purely domestically in China and that project went nowhere I think the rumor was some kind of like a, a draft of the film or a cut of the film was released and it was so bad they realized that they couldn't keep it going that was what I heard mm. um the project passed to Amazon so already like a foreign company albeit one I don't know that perhaps it was like a partnership with Amazon I don't know that went nowhere and now it's firmly in like a, a American global media company you know um totally it's it's the the project has left domestic you know at least in the in the world of film production it's it's been lost to to America if we're, if we're using like mm. a nation state <laughs> um, power struggle view of things and I wonder if before that news surfaced this the, it's kind of like a teacher seeing something go wrong oh well look we've we've bungled we had a, a shot to adapt three body we bungled it so hard now their production's moved to our you know our, our rival country America so I wonder if the film film bureau made that announcement because they don't want stuff like that to happen again that's my theory mm. that's that's a very good theory um and I think uh yeah, it would seem that way. I certainly think that um, America or at least Hollywood or, or, you know, certain 
well, I'm just thinking more really about um, Disney's recent adaptation of right. Mulan, which mm. I have not seen, but I have heard a lot about it. And it seems um, if people aren't too happy with it. Uh, I think it just kind of butchers Chinese uh, culture, essentially, or, or the history. And um, mm. or I say, that, yeah, like di- different elements. Um, I think somebody said it really well. I was watching this review um, of it and they said they, uh, you know, that Disney's very happy to take uh, the money of Chinese people, but they are not ready. It would seem to sort of respect their culture. From what it sounds like, there wasn't any, um, you know, Chinese writing staff or, um, right. you know, perhaps um, even if they had sort of uh, consultants, I don't know if um, their ideas were considered all that. All that well so I kind of yeah I can imagine there'd be um some fear of uh of perhaps it um, being mishandled um but also I don't know maybe, maybe not maybe um it, it's quite a, a good thing or you know in the mind of uh certain officials in that um you know at least if it's given to an American you know company to to develop then it might be more globalized or, or have more of a global appeal while still retaining some kind of Chinese characteristics I, I'm I'm really not sure because I don't know much about how it's going to be developed but um yeah, yeah. it really could go either way I think it'll either be you know well done or very very bad <laughs> so um but what, yeah. what are your what are your thoughts then on that? yeah I'm ab- absolutely fascinated to see how um I guess how much or how little they choose to modify it um because mm. like on, on one hand i think a pretty good ideal would be just do a straight adaptation don't try and make it friendly for western audiences don't add lots of americans please <laughs> um, <laughs> don't soften the harder to palate nasty stuff um that's one ideal i'd like to see on the other hand i can't help but feel one shortcoming of um the Shin's story is that Although on its face, it's a story about humanity coming together. And when I was reading it the first time, I was like, oh, there's an international cast. If, if, you, if you go back and look at it, it's not really much of an international cast. There's just some mm-hmm. Westerners who are all basically jerks. And <laughs> yeah. one Japanese woman who turns out, spoilers, uh, to also be a jerk. And we have a robot, an alien robot, who weirdly seems to be Japanese and is also a jerk. Um, mm-hmm. And that's it. Um, so the other ideal I like to see is like a truly like international take on the whole thing because it is you know from like the view of like a, a story it's an amazing piece of cultural exchange between China and the rest of the world and why not give it a properly international cast but the thing is I don't really trust American media to do internationalism because it's usually um, their version and they're mm. not really the best at understanding other countries even when they're not so culturally different from them let alone china <laughs> precisely mm, absolutely yeah i can't, couldn't agree more mm. yeah so i'll just have to wait and see i suppose what happens with that project yeah i mean even if it turns out badly it'll at least it'll be interesting to think about definitely, uh, definitely. read all the think yeah. pieces and the angry tweets <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. We can't wait for more of those. Yes. Can't get enough angry tweets. <laughs> yeah, there's never enough. Um, yeah, so here's a question that ties into the last one. And I this is mm. one where I'm not going to have any smart answer because I have no idea. I just need to be educated. What is China's space policy? I mean, this has nothing <laughs> to do with cat country, but I'm sure the listeners, mm. now that we've got an expert on the show, please, um, what, what what is China's space policy? Ah, well, um, I... I suppose well when I say that I um, research Chinese space policy, um, I think what I'm more referring to is um, policy surrounding their civil space program. Um, because of course, uh, you know, there is never really just one big policy. Um, it's right. more lots of different policies kind of put together, and we might be looking at their um, you know military space program or different. Uh, policies on um, you know the commercial space scene um but what i more or less look at is um sort of this idea of um i suppose um their national civil space program which i would say is primarily made up of um uh what's the word i'm looking for um uh I don't know, official government run organizations um so uh, or space organizations so what I tend to look at more is um, again the diplomacy of uh, this space program um, and how China essentially um, decides to um, or the kind of policies it 
uh, adheres to, um, at least um, to the public and the international public, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. So I think uh, perhaps the first place, if anybody was interested in uh, finding out what the Chinese space program uh, purports to be all about is in their white papers um, that they publish on their space activities, which are released every five years. So the last one was released in 2016. So we're kind of due a new one soon. Mm, exciting. Um, Exactly. Yeah. So uh, this kind of just um, it kind of emphasizes what they're all about, really. And a lot of that focuses on international cooperation. Um, so China says um, that their space program is a very open one, even though it has been criticized by, you know, um, the US for being, not being all that transparent. Um, but they really do emphasize um, this policy of international cooperation and openness to um all nations. Uh, so, for instance, uh, their um, their space station. Um, once that is finally up and running, they um, have said that anybody will be able to use, or at least anybody from. Sorry, not anybody. What am I talking about? Like any country uh, who is, you know, a United Nations member state will be able to make use of their space station, which is um, in contrast to uh, the US space policy, which excludes China. Uh, they have a China exclusion policy, so they do not welcome to um, work on collaborative proje uh, projects if that makes sense. So mm. um, again, there's this idea of international cooperation and openness. Um, uh, they uh, talk a lot about utilizing outer space for peaceful purposes um, and using their space technology to promote um, uh, social development, um, both within China and also outside of China. Um, so what I look at a lot is um, different types of cooperative ventures with other nations. Um, so what kind of activities they do with other nations, how much they finance different uh, satellite projects, for instance, um, offering different grants in order for uh, certain uh, countries to develop their own space technologies. Um, there's also uh, this policy of wanting to create a long-term, stable and very independent, um, so made at home kind of um, technologies. Um, right. So even though, um, again, there's criticism from various uh, Western countries that China has um, developed their space program thanks to reverse engineering. And um, uh, again, there's this fear of uh, theft um, within you know, the space sector. Um, China really does purport to uh, adhere to this. Um, and it's a very important part of uh, their uh, kind of space ideology, um, this adherence to a very uh, independent uh, development of certain uh, space technologies. Uh, do that, am I making sense? Is that kind yeah, of, it makes a lot of sense. Like, okay, good. Um, there's also this, again, this adherence and this policy um, to very integrated planning and coordinated development um, across China. Um, so China does now have a lot of um, independent private space companies. Um, but again, uh, it's very difficult to say how much of a hand um, the Chinese government has in what these um, uh, corporations, these private corporations and enterprises choose to develop and what they choose to focus on. Um, so again, so there's this idea, so I kind of look at um, cooperation with other countries and policies surrounding that. And also a lot of what I'm looking at is this development of a Chinese space culture. Um, which I think is very interesting. And I think this is also um, something that they have policies on, which is, again, uh, very interesting to look at. For instance, when we look at um, uh, the development of a sort of space culture in the US, for instance, um, around the time of the, um, you know, the space race, we often think of you know, certain elements of that developing quite naturally, for instance, um, you know, when science, when science fiction is concerned. Um, but when you look kind of a little bit more deeply into it, you see that um, there was a lot of planning and, and marketing done around this kind of creation or this development of a space culture in, in the US. So again, what I'm sort of looking at is, is policies relating to this development of a space culture in China. Um, and there are a few from what I've found, and these have not again been translated into English. So it's not something that 
you know, a uh, uh, Western audience would really know or recognize. So, sorry, I, I've been talking a lot. I'll stop there no, if you no, want to no, ask yeah. any, any questions. Is there more to say or is, is it is it good if I jump in here? Um, yeah, no, yeah, go ahead. I think it's yeah. good to jump in. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what you were saying about reading, like about the the white the white papers and stuff, I've, I've seen instances, I think it's just on Twitter, so who knows how, how well grounded it is, but um, instances where the announcements that the Chinese government will disseminate in English to international audiences will say one thing and then internal uh, news in, in Chinese being on, on platforms like Xinhua, which are for an internal domestic audience, will say mm. almost the opposite thing. Um, I think one example I saw was um, the, the Global Times or China Daily or something saying that China was going to continue to pursue a reform and opening up uh open markets body body blah, blah and then the internal message said we're going to follow the socialist uh program and uh become a you know the more a more clean economy or something like that mm. so you know two very noble causes that just happen to be diametrically opposed to each other um at a that's, uh, that's level. very yeah sorry sorry i interrupted you in the last yeah <laughs> yeah so i was just gonna say do you see anything like that um looking at messaging directed outwards and inwards are there any discrepancies like that or is it fairly consistent that is a uh, really interesting that you should mention that because that is exactly what my uh, master's dissertation was on um Excellent. i was looking at <laughs> i was looking at um how uh it was specifically the people's daily um were depicting their uh shenzhou so their their crude um their space flight missions um so they the human um space flight one so it was um six different ones that they had at the time and still do so there hasn't been one six different um Shenzhou missions that they've actually have any included um humans so uh yeah I was basically just looking at how this was depicted in the news uh to a Chinese audience and how it was depicted to a western audience um or at least kind of an English-speaking audience um and yeah absolutely um I found quite a few differences uh between those um and again it's 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 quite difficult to say if um so I, I did a kind of a lot of um corpus analysis with this so it was a very in-depth study um so i don't know if there's been that much change since um you know kind of in, in recent years with uh, xi jinping coming coming into power and um you know having any kind of effect on how um you know the media conducts itself um internally mm -hmm. and externally but um what i found was that um particularly in their first in the first instance so when when um i'm trying to think of the best way to say this when when they sent their first man into space that's it so when they sent their first man to space um the external so the, the english language um news uh, often highlighted uh, other international countries saying things or representatives from international mm. uh, or other countries so you had um news like oh china sent its first into space um britain congratulates china mm. you know france congratulates china uh you know nasa say this is a massive deal it's it's a really good thing and this was in the um again this english language media and i think they did that a lot because they i think were trying to kind of convince you know this the reader like oh yes it's a very positive thing and the international community agrees it's a very positive thing mm -hmm. and then um in some articles in the chinese versions it was saying things like um are the you know us it, it looks down on us and um mm -hmm. this is a great you know opportunity for us to show those um you know westerners essentially that you know we can um we can uh, uh, you know be we as good as them too. technologically yeah. exactly yeah and um we won't you know they, they keep saying oh we're um they're sorry they keep um accusing china of stealing technology but we've shown them that we can do this independently and, and really kind of it was a lot more forceful um the the narratives there um also i noticed you know some of the articles there were um things in the chinese language within the Chinese language articles um, that were left out of the English language articles um, that were talking about um, the, um, uh, the, sorry, the kind of like re, uh, what's the word, reinstatement of Taiwan into, you know, China's leadership or, or rule. Yes, I think, I think that's called the Third World War. Mm, yeah, exactly. Um, so there were there were things like that, you know, um, kind of more controversial. That's what I mean. There are more controversial topics um, yeah. being talked about in the Chinese, uh, or at least that would be controversial to uh, perhaps a Western audience. Um, and the kind of general themes in the English language media were that, oh, yes, this is a great thing. Um, China is here to, what's the word, um, help 
the world develop um yeah, we're going to be like a well. cooperative um oh i used to listen to like diplomacy podcasts and I, yeah there's like a term that's just escaping my um but yeah like take a seat at the table be part of like the global order blah blah, blah. there's mm. a there's a term that's really bothering me that i'm not thinking of it but yeah but be like just another uh player at the big friendly table sort of thing Precisely. Yeah, you've uh, summarised it better than I can. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, absolutely. It was definitely more nationalistic, I would say, in the Chinese language media mm-hmm. and a lot more. It was a lot more focus. Um, in fact, very little focus on any kind of nationalistic themes, a lot more focus on international cooperation and collaboration um, and peaceful kind of purposes, or rather the Chinese space program was to be used for peace. Um, uh, to bring peace across the world essentially peaceful cooperation <laughs> right so i kind of uh, i butchered all of uh, all of that because i'm uh, i'm really trying to think back um uh, kind of uh, the the results that i had but that was kind of the the, the gist of it really of it. Um, yeah yeah i wish i could say i was surprised but yeah seems <laughs> seems about right <laughs> yeah this, we've kind of gone into this already but do you do you think any i think this might be more relevant to the screen than than mm. um, print or writ- the written word because I think cinema is so much more ham-fisted um, and I think it's used more for national messaging than than, than books are. Mm. But the question is, in like modern uh, Chinese sci-fi, be it on the page or on the screen, do you think any of it that's coming out is relevant to said kind of like visions of China's space program? Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, as you mentioned, I think you're right. It- seen a lot more um or at least i think the chinese government are trying to make sure this is implemented or, or certain narratives and uh imagery is uh included in cinema uh, rather than literature um so as you already mentioned um we have this uh uh national film bureau i think would be a good translation um and also yeah. the china association for science and technology um who issued these um I think it's EGN, like opinions, I suppose, kind of like suggestions um, yeah. on the promotion of uh, development of science fiction films. Um, and they obviously included, um, as you said, the kind of highlighted Chinese values, Chinese aesthetics and mm. rooting narratives in this kind of um, in, in mm. contemporary Chinese innovations and the showing China being at the forefront of science and technology. Um, mm. and, and then also so- like guidelines for just the um, what you call it the infrastructure to domestically produce these things mm, precisely well the values, so the, the values in the economy one each one serving the other definitely definitely and uh, i think that also um this idea of promoting a good china also comes with this promotion or includes this promotion of a good and, and peaceful image of uh of china and so in terms of so that's kind of science fiction more generally, I think. So if we're talking about um, the depictions of China's space program, again, it's uh, it seems like um, the government wants to promote this uh, peaceful image of the Chinese space program, a cooperative one. And because, yeah, they, they clearly see that these films um, have the potential to become um, popular, uh, reach a, a large audience, kind of uh, traverse these national boundaries. And so I think, what did I, I published something or got something published rather recently in the Science Fiction Research Association Review, which I know you've read because I, I heard you mention that issue yeah, in um, one of your podcasts. Yes, um, yeah, episodes. Ways uh, article, yeah. Mm, that's right. Um, so I uh, I wrote a little something in there about um, depictions of a China space program in the Wandering Earth movie that came out. Um, and again, the film was very highly praised by government officials, and it even became kind of recommended viewing in schools um, as well. And um, yeah. I thought that was quite interesting. Um, how it's so kind of highly praised, and um, even in uh, you know it was even written about quite a lot in uh, state media for a Western audience. Like, I think they were trying to get the word out about this film. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so it essentially it presents China as a, a leader in space technology and also an equal and trusted partner with the international uh, community. We see um, you know, China being, you know, essentially respected very much. The you know scenes of um, uh, who is it? I can't remember the name, but it's um, the he's a Chinese. Uh, he, he works with Chinese space 
well, it's not really a, it's more of an international space program, isn't it, in the film? Um, yeah. But then they all have kind of their nationalities plastered on their Oh, uniforms. it's very big on flags and dividing mm. everybody up. Exactly, yeah, yeah which is uh, interesting. Um, so mm. the, it's very clear who China is. And, um, you know, we have the scene where um, I think he's standing and he's kind of being thanked for service and you have all these other nationalities around him clapping and, and thanking him for, you know, being a part of uh, the, you know, the community. Um, and then, of course, uh, in the end, um, it's the Chinese astronauts who end up sacrificing them themselves for the good of humanity. Um, and also, uh, this is kind of... I think it's a lot more subtle and um, you can only really, I think, pick up on it in sort of the production notes and also in um, kind of uh, interviews with the director. Um, there's this kind of uh, notion of China or Chinese science fiction promoting an image of wanting to protect the Earth while, rather than move away from it, like uh, is seen in a lot of um, US science fiction. Um, right. If that makes sense. I think this might become a stronger theme as more uh, films come out, this idea of wanting to protect the earth and not just leave it because, um, and I, again, I think this is um, perhaps because uh, of the fact that China's history is so long standing, right? You know, they kind of um, right. leave themselves have 5,000 years of history and then this idea of just leaving earth to go elsewhere. It's just not something that they want to do. They want to kind of remain rooted. Um, to their home and I think they're trying to present a different uh, idea of what the future could look like um, instead yeah. of just kind of taking off and going to a different planet um, I think that is something that might work in in China's favor if they um, all co uh, collaborate and kind of build this up to be a part of their you know comprehensive Chinese space culture in a sense or how they're going to yeah. navigate possible futures when the earth is or finds itself in peril if yeah that makes sense. <laughs> no i see what you're saying and okay. I, i'm thinking um to kind of push back against the sort of um blood and soil has really far right connotations but like this kind of native soil nationalism uh, of course of course people with that mindset don't want films where we leave the earth because the idea of being defined by your native soil suddenly becomes ridiculous when you're a light year away from it and th th what you s were saying about um, scenes where China, the, the Chinese people are, are, are looking good or a leader it makes me think of like two scenes in the film that I think one is supposed to give you that message and the other is maybe a little bit more subtle and I think it's more successful. So the ham-fisted one is the scene in the Wandering Earth film where we just have a montage of all the different, it's like different cockpits of different nationalities. Um, I don't know what you call it, but all the different people of the different nationalities, they've given up on saving the earth. They think they're screwed. Um, it's like, so you see like the Americans and the French and the British and they're all slouched. And then because we're going by national stereotypes in the Japanese cabin, they've committed... Uh, Harry Kiri, <laughs> obviously, because yeah. that's what Japanese people do, mm -hmm. um, even hundreds of years in the future. And then and then China steps in and saves the day and everyone uh, gets back up and cheers them on, except, I guess, the the, Jap the impaled Japanese astronauts. Mm. I guess they're not coming mm. back. So, I don't know, anyone who doesn't just swallow exactly what the film tells them is probably going to see how silly that scene is i i think mm. but then earlier in the film there's a scene i really where i was i guess where i hadn't given up on the film by that point where we see the living quarters of our main characters on the underneath the earth and mm -hmm. spaceship earth and it's um it's kind of like a sort of a cyber punky it looked kind of like some of the cool bars you'd see in shanghai or beijing there was like grimy lighting ping pong neon it looked sort of like a cool modern chinese city but they're in space and i think mm. if you're looking for some soft power trying to make china look it's like some you know with something with cool or positive or non-threatening connotations that was the good one that was the good scene mm. but on yet on the other hand what what are these filmmakers saying about themselves when they're looking into a future where humanity is on a common mission and yet people are still at the level of the dorms divided up by their own not even their well both their ethnicities but like their national boundaries like it's pretty depressing in a way it makes me feel it is. that's mm. the, that's the vision of human humankind working together that we still segregate ourselves Mm, yeah, it is. Uh, I, I did think that was quite bizarre to see, you know, even though we have this 
uh, as we say, this kind of international um, uh, goal and uh, it's global goal. And now we have this global space program. We still have different nationalities, you know, uh, plastered on uniforms and it's still very much a thing. Um, yeah, it, it's it's almost, um, yeah, I don't really know what to say about that. It's just, it's just weird, isn't it? It's, I, it's I guess depressing. a bit like, yeah, I guess I can know it a bit like cat country. It's a supposed mm. vision of the future, but it's really comment on the present. It's it's mm. uh, the reason that nations haven't dissolved and like Leo Sishin's vision of the future is because I guess he's living today and he's he's in some way projecting today into tomorrow even mm. despite all of his imagination because yeah that's not it's not unique to uh, wandering Earth in in three body we don't I don't think we ever see any sign of nationalities dissolving at least not until very 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 far mm. in the end of the universe in the future or something. definitely. Yeah. Yeah, but I uh, I would just think with uh, cat country, definitely it's it's something that's uh, meant to be a commentary on you know today's world and and how um, you know different countries end up you know, fighting amongst each each other. Um, but then you would think that in the future um, you would like I would think that would be quite a good vision to have. And it would, I would think oh if we have this global goal, we sure we should not have um, you know different nationality. I don't know. Is it? Hmm, I'd have to think about that a bit more. But um, yeah, it, it would almost seem like it wouldn't be part of an ideal or an idealised future. Um, yeah. you know, this kind of segregation that we have. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it's a it's a, a big clue that it, the, the Mars has countries too, because despite it being another planet, they don't seem to be very far. They don't seem to be ahead of the people of Earth at all. In fact, the people mm. of Cat Country are, I've never seen a gun before. <laughs> So yeah, it's it, you. You could read of them as being more backwards than the people mm. on Earth. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, okay. Is there anything else we can say about Cat Country? Because um, I think I'm running out of breath here. <laughs> yeah, we've uh, we've been talking for a long time. Um, I think uh, what? Well, um, I mentioned that I kind of went back to the Chinese version because I was quite interested mm. to see how some terms have been translated. Um, just kind of out of interest, really. Oh, yeah. um, oh I, you know what? I forgot to ask for a mm. word of the day, and I also I left out the question about um, if Cat Country was a drink. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Cat Country was a drink. Yeah, I, I tried to put a uh, word of the day and if the story was a drink in all the questions I sent to my guests and I left them out on your one. But yeah, you were about to say some words, so maybe we could pick one of those for our word of the day. Ah, okay. Um, well, I was just thinking, I, well, when I was reading Cat Country in English, I really wanted to know how, um, well, reverie leaves in particular, this kind of um, uh, satirical substitute for opium um mm. how was that written in the original um and it's me yeah so yeah being like leaf but then me meaning um well it kind of means different things depending on you know what what you pair it with so um it's kind of me as in me who or me who so you know, confused um or to confuse uh, also like me sure so to be lost or to lose one's way also mm. me lu that that kind of me um so i thought that was quite interesting about um the kind of connotations of using that word um to describe these leaves because it kind of means you know it's kind of being confused or, or lost or bewildered and um perhaps that refers to you know what it makes these these cats or cat people feel or what it makes them become um right. but also uh it also can be used in like million so like to be infatuated with or crazy about so um i thought that uh, you know this kind of character to describe these leaves um uh, you know that, that all of that kind of um uh meaning didn't really come across in the term reverie leaves i didn't think although i couldn't really think of any better translation i think translation did a very good job but um i think there's always something lost in translation um so i think that was perhaps one thing i don't know if you've got any thoughts on that or yeah i think that's the the synonym i was thinking of there was like disoriented like a disorientation mm. leaf and yeah the whole society is totally disoriented they they're, they're totally directionless i guess one thing we didn't mention is that there was um there's reference that there's um i think it's said outright that the cat country used to be a really great um power you know much like you know mm. maybe warlord china looking back on song china tang china han dynasty china all these great times are behind them and everything feels like it's in a downward spiral so yeah just disorientation yeah it's and it's good to know that that's where the reverie leaf comes from because reverie has one connotation but like you're saying that character me 
could mean a few other things. And if, if uh, Lyle, the translator, had taken it another way, um, he could have given us in, in the English different but not wrong connotations. So yeah, mm. interesting to know. And I guess we can pick me, yeah, as our, as our word of the day. Mm, okay, harder mm. question. If Cat Country uh -oh. was a drink, what drink do you think it would be? And you can go if for drink. hard drinks, soft drinks, hot drinks, cold drinks. Oh, this is something I've not even... <laughs> well, you've not really thought of it because I was stupid and didn't no. give you a list of questions. No, it's all right. right. Um, if it was a drink, so um, I think it would be something very bitter, maybe like a very bitter coffee, um, mm. like a black coffee, I think, perhaps, or is that too basic? We had um, that in um, an interview I did oh, a, really? a couple of days ago. <laughs> we had this oh, strong black try. coffee because it was a fast-paced novel. Mm, this okay. one maybe like a red bull and vodka or a <laughs> because we have the combo of absolute mania and absolute um dissolution and i feel like i like I, that i like yeah. that a lot yeah i think i would have to agree with you there just um mm -hmm. yes i like that and also it definitely makes you know if i drink it it'll make me feel a bit um confused and, and disoriented and like i want to throw up at some points like uh when reading this book i was just like oh this is too much to handle um so definitely yeah i think that's a great description um yeah oh, i was i was going to say absinthe yeah. but i've never had absinthe so i wouldn't know but again something that just no. something that's the closest liquid legal form of like opium you know something that just mm. destroys you that's a Oh, that's a, another really good uh, idea. Again, I haven't had absence either. Ab, sorry, absinthe either, but um, mm. yeah, but I do like the Red Bull vodka drink. Have you had that before? Has that been a no? Actually, I've had no. red. I had Red Bull as a kid, and I was like, whoa, never mm. again. Uh, I, did, <laughs> I did have um, Jaeger bombs, uh, you know, age eighteen, nineteen, and that was enough for me. Mm. Yeah, it's not very nice. I don't think is a no, it's not, um, it's not, is it? no but um you've uh you've racked up about i think it's almost 40 podcast episodes have you have you come up with 40 different drinks for no 40 I've, different books? I've implemented these things at first inconsistently now i'm getting consistent although obviously not that <laughs> consistent because i didn't put the question on the paper but no i was yeah. thinking should i make like a page logging all my words of the day and all the drinks of the episode and I think I thought it's a nice, it will entertain me. Will it entertain the listener? Will anyone actually <laughs> look at the page? Probably not. Um, I'll save it for when I've got, you know, millions of followers. It's <laughs> one idea for sure. Mm, Going, the other problem is I didn't keep a record. Like it's not, it's not in the show notes. So I would have to listen to all the episodes and. Ah, right. I see. I, okay, I'm, I'm narcissistic, but... but I'm not that narcissistic. <laughs> Well, I like it as a question. I think it's a very good question to, to ask. Um, yeah, uh, very unique. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't give a better answer. I, think, I do think yours is, is very good, though. And yeah, I would have to agree. Well, um, um, I, I like yeah. getting compliments. So thanks. Um, <laughs> let's let's uh, finish off now. Let's, let's okay. go to our further reading. Oh, no, actually, well, here's a further reading question. You mentioned mm. your article in the science fiction uh, review thing what what where can list, I, I will put a link to that in the show notes but what is it called oh, no. and then, that way i can um, find it and then get the link and stuff oh well if you must insist it's um uh so it's in the science fiction research association right. um so they publish a review every i think um you know every quarter uh um and so i think that this was a special um uh sorry this was a special um not episode what's the right word a special issue uh, issue that's right it was a special issue um all about kind of chinese science fiction in particular um and so i think uh uh this would be, yeah like if you've anybody is interested in um i think science fiction in china they should definitely uh, check it out because it's got a lot of um good articles bar mine so <laughs> um yeah i would definitely say uh, give it a read. Okay, fantastic. Um, right, now let's go to our further reading questions proper. Would you like to recommend any books at all for any listeners? So like anyone who might enjoy Cat Country, um, where else might you direct them? Oh, um, if they like Cat Country, they, so I have very recently been reading um, 
the trial by Kafka and oh, um, that, that is equally uh, very infuriating I think if you like to read about infuriating um, kind of leadership and bureaucracy and uh, and kind of like feeling like you're in a nightmare I would say <laughs> check that out definitely mm -hmm. Um, what do you what do you think? Do you think that's a an okay recommendation? Uh, the only Kafka I've read is, is the, the Metamorphosis, and I listened to a bit of the mm. Castle as an audiobook. Um, mm. And actually, yeah, the Castle had um, the classic. I guess Metamorphosis doesn't really have this, but like yeah, the Castle had like the the classic Kafka esque situation of he's just he's trying he's trying to get some answers from people who supposedly know what's going on, or he's just trying to relate to people, and he just gets like the. Um, spiritual equivalent of a slap in the face slap in the face <laughs> over and mm. over and over and you know some of us don't get enough of that in our real lives and like to read about it <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah so yeah, i think either of those um oh, yeah they'd, they'd be good to read um mm -hmm. if you like being tortured through literature um so yeah. it's safer than you know for real mm, definitely um i'm trying to think of others um i mean if anybody is interested in um again kind of uh culture space culture um i would say again there is um not that much written about chinese space culture at the moment as it's still developing and, and i think there's still being sorry there's still research being done around its development um but i thought that you know, reading certain books on like the US and Soviet space culture are quite a good way to, um, mm. you know, become quite aware of uh, particularly what can be cultivated by uh, a government or a leadership um, and the kind of directions that uh, these countries have had to take in their interpretations of space exploration and its propagation to the public. Um, so I think uh, a good book, um, if you're interested in that, a nonfiction book is Space and the American Imagination and also one on the Soviet space um, space culture is called Soviet space culture, um, cosmic enthusiasm in socialist societies. Um, so I think those two are good starting places if anybody's interested in, in that. It's a very good subtitle, cosmic enthusiasm mm. in socialist societies. It is, it's, it's very good. Um, yeah. yeah, that's cool. Um, here's a question, what are you reading just now? Oh, well, I am um, a bit of a serial pick up books, read a chapter of them and put them down and replace it with another book person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think um, I, in terms of fiction, I'm, what am I reading? The, the last thing I picked up was um, Narcissus and Goldmund by Herman Hesse. Um, and uh, that, that's quite good so far. Um, in terms of non-fiction, um, again, I, I think it's it's sometimes quite hard going to try and read non-fiction outside of, you know, your, your research, because it's just, you tend to get a bit of an accumulation then of, of non-fiction. But um, I'm currently yeah. um, reading a lot of books that are coming out by the Verso uh, 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 yep. publication company, because um, yeah. they've recently... Um, what have they done? They've created this kind of book club subscription and you can get a lot of um, books for very little cost, really. And a lot of them come in ebook form, but um, depending on the kind of subscription you get, you can get some uh, uh, hardback copies or paperback copies as well. Um, so because I'm trying to, yeah, just trying to read more, um, I think, in the way of um, uh, socialist theory, Marxist theory, um, critical theory, that kind of along that kind of line. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, I think I think that's a good subscription to get. Um, but yeah, do you, do, you, um, do you read a lot from, or do you read a lot? Uh, sorry, do you, do you tend to consume a lot from that particular publisher or Verso? Um, I don't think mm. I've got any Verso books. I bought mm. my sibling uh, where it was like, "What do you want for your birthday?" Mm. I want this. Can I have it? Yes. I think that mm. was a Verso book. Mm. But no, I've I've known about them for a while, um, and there's it, it, probably if I was filling up my own Christmas list, I could I could have a browse. But no, uh, I don't think I've got any. I don't think I have any Verso books. Mm. Uh, well, I definitely recommend them because I think they're very fair in their pricing. Um, mm. I think that's kind of what they stand for, um, essentially. You know, uh, this uh, wanting to um, or allow people to read their books for as cheaply as possible, um, essentially. And I think they do a very good job of that. And they often give out uh, free ebooks um, as well. Uh, so it's always good to be on the lookout for those, I think. Um, yeah. mm. Mm. I was on their website recently, actually, it occurs to mm. me. 
I was um, doing a, a bonus episode on um, on the for the Patreon, which is up. Oh, no, wait, no, it's not up. It's scheduled. It will be up eventually. But it was on the story of that Shanghai magazine and its founder. And like a weird thing I noticed. So when I was working for them, I was an intern for them briefly, and um, they were owned by this company, mysterious, shadowy parent company called mm-hmm. Urban Atomy. I had been learning about. Um, well, various things. There's a podcast I listened to called Weird Studies that covered this guy. And he was also a former colleague of Mark Fisher, an academic who I, a deceased academic who I really like. But there was this guy called Nick Land, who was some sort of a radical theorist in in, in like 90s uh, England. And then went on to become an absolute, uh, like, I don't know, alt-right loony and moved to <laughs> Shanghai and published a book I think it was he probably he he wrote the guide to the Shanghai 2010 Expo Africa if he called that urban atomy but he had he was using urban anatomy as his brand and Ooh. yet this the like one of the first expat magazines in Shanghai which is now supposedly in Chinese state hands is earned is owned by this or what was owned by a company that was called urban anatomy seems to have since changed their name and I was trying to like there is nothing that pieces this stuff together online it's obviously an investigation waiting to be done. But um, yeah, Versal Books, bringing it back to Versal Books, they've got something by Nick Land, I guess, from his pre uh, right wing nut job days. Wow, and that is wild. Mm, what, a, what a character transformation right there. Right, yes. Yeah. Um, I think he was on meth. I think that might have been. <laughs> part of the I thing see. There. Yeah, mm-hmm. a, few too, a, little, a few too many proverbial uh, vodka and uh, Red Bulls. But yeah, <laughs> Versal Books has like a good article on like they I think it's like on like his author page in place of like just a short bio they have like a full-on kind of article on his thought and why it was relevant in its time and where it went Uh, and it's there are various articles on well there's lots of articles on his ideas but like I was trying to figure out what happened (laughs) to the guy and um, this versal thing was pretty interesting well without being without focusing on the really depressing stuff about where his mind took him um, but yeah yeah well I'm really looking forward to the podcast episode you do about that this kind of investigative uh, um, kind of uh, episode well I didn't but, find out yeah. very much it's all basically just uh, an extension of the speculation that you heard there mm. um, but yeah listeners if listeners want to check that out that will be coming up on the show's Patreon I think oh I've scheduled that one for Halloween because <laughs> um, mm. he's such a creepy guy that one's coming out on Halloween oh, very fitting uh-huh. <laughs> Now that I've hit Nick Land, I know I need to stop. So um, yeah. I really just say thank, thank you for so much for um, for coming on the show. It's been a fantastic chat. And of course, uh, if you want to come back on and talk about more spacey books, then you'd be very welcome to. Oh, thank you so much, Angus. And thank you so much for having me. This has been a pleasure. Likewise. Well, that's the end of our strange journey through cat country. Hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. That was a great chat, and it is a very good, entertaining, if somewhat depressing novel, so you guys should definitely check it out. Here are some other things you can check out uh, if you enjoy this show. So first of all, if you're not subscribed to us yet, you can do that through pretty much any podcast provider. Um, To get full show notes and all the best links to all the best places, and to see the uh, art I make for, each, make for each episode, you should go to the podcast's homepage. That's at trchfic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C dot podbean dot com. That's just, it's just the best. You should definitely go there. It's even better than the City of the Cats. I would, I would venture to say it's a hundred times better than the City of the Cats. If you'd like to support the show um, financially, which means with your money, uh, there's two places you can do that. There's Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee. Buy Me A Coffee is the place for uh, a one-off contribution. Patreon, you know, that is uh, that is a recurring donation. It goes on forever. Um, but in return, you get access to all the bonus shows I make. And there are dozens and dozens of them now. Uh, they go on for hours and hours. And there's a particularly interesting one, that one about that Shanghai magazine and Nick Lyon that's coming out on Halloween which at the time I'm recording this outro is just five days away. Very scary indeed. Um, Money aside, if you'd like to follow me on social media and keep up with the podcast news and uh, sneaky advance information, 
there's a few different useful platforms. One is the show's uh, Discord, where you can talk to other uh, fans of the show and, and stuff. So the link to that will be in the show notes and on the top right of the podcast homepage. That's Discord. Um, to follow myself on Twitter, uh, it's just at Angus Likes Words. I mostly tweet about the show or other things related to uh, to Chinese lit. Uh, the podcast has its own Instagram. It's just at Churchific. So you can't really go wrong there. Um, yeah, those are all the main things. But here's the really, really special thing. Um, the best thing you can do for the show. And that is to spread the words. So tell your local Reverie Leaf dealer, your local warlord, um, or just a cat that happens to be standing near you when you're listening to this. Uh, because it's probably a Martian. So grab that cat and yell in its ear, listen to the translated Chinese fiction podcast and we'll we'll have a new listener and hopefully a new Patreon uh, supporter as well. And I'll have you to thank for that. So um, yeah, off you go and do that. And until next episode, Zai Jian. Bye.